I will call the uh, meeting of the January 23rd Plan Commission meeting to order. Uh, first, we will hear from our technical facilitator. All right, welcome to our virtual plan commission. We're gonna cover a few basic items before beginning. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link or calling the number in your original email. To members and city staff, members of are able, please activate your video and keep it on for the duration of the meeting. Staff of are able, please activate your video when you are speaking. Use the raise hand feature when you'd like to be recognized to speak or ask questions. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do the best to call on committee members in the order in which their hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the commission, please send it to the email list in today's agenda. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, communications disclosures and recusals. Members of the body should make any required disclosures or recusals under the city's ethics code. Are there any disclosures or recusals? I'm seeing no raised hands. So we will go on then to uh, public comment. Um, I see that there is one registrant, Kyle Judd, um, 1129 Meadow Sweet Drive, Madison, and he is saying opposed, wishing to speak, and I'm wondering if he intended to just register under number three. Uh, do we have a Kyle Judd in the queue? Uh, Chair, I'm not finding anyone uh, by that name. Okay, thank you. Uh, then moving on um, to the minutes of January 9th regular meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Seeing no raised hands, is there a motion to approve? Moved by Commissioner Solheim. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Um, upcoming meetings. We have regular meetings on February 13th, 27th, and then March 13th and 27th. Um, next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. So it is the custom of the plan commission to remove from the agenda those items on which the staff believes an application has had sufficient review to warrant approval with all of the conditions placed upon it by various city departments and on which the applic applicant accepts those conditions and there are no individuals who have registered to speak in opposition to the item. Uh, those, along with any referrals, are placed on the consent agenda, and they're addressed at the beginning of our meeting. Then people who are interested in those items can disconnect um, unless they want to unless they want to stay, um, and unless a member of the plan commission requests separation, in which case the item is removed from the consent agenda and taken in the regular course of business. Of the items before us today, I'll read the agenda items that are proposed for the consent agenda first. Um, agenda item two, then for referral, agenda item three, and then for consent, 
agenda items 7, 8, 9, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 23, and 24. Um, are there any requests for separation? Any requests for separation? I don't see any raised hands, so I'll read those items then into the record. So again, agenda item two, Legistar 75503, relief from conditions of gifts and dedication per Wisconsin statutes of outlaw seven, second edition to Truax Air Park West for, the, for replatting a portion of the plat. And then for referral, agenda item three, Legistar 75151, at the request of both the applicant and Alder to be referred to February 27. Legist, uh, agenda item seven, Legistar 74909, um, 1309 through 1311, Teresa Terrace, 20th Alder District, consideration of demolition permit to demolish a two family residence. Agenda item eight, Legistar 75173, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located at 1309 through 1311, Teresa Terrace, 20 Alder District, from um, suburban residential consistent three to suburban residential varied district. Agenda item nine, uh, Legistar 74910, located at 1401 through 1403, Teresa Terrace, 20th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a two-family residence, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of the property at that same location from suburban residential consistent three to suburban residential varied district, Agenda item 13, Legistar 74907, located at 4522 East Washington Avenue, 17th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a commercial building. Agenda item 14, Legistar 74908, located at 4522 East Washington Avenue, 17th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the commercial corridor transitional district for a vehicle access sales and service windows for a restaurant. Agenda item 15, Legistar 74058, located uh, approving a certified survey map of property owned by Galway Companies Incorporated located at 4522 East Washington Avenue, 17th Alder District. Agenda item 16, uh, Legistar 75247, amending the Ratman Neighborhood Development Plan to revise the land use recommendation for approximately 24 acres of land located on the east side of East Park Boulevard as proposed Dreamer Drive from employment to community mixed use. Agenda item 17, Legistar 75182, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of properties, portions of property located at 4846 East Park Boulevard, 17th Alder District, from Suburban Employment Center District to Commercial Corridor Transitional District, and creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of portions of property located at 4846 East Park Boulevard from Suburban Employment Center District to Traditional Residential Urban 2 District. Uh, agenda item 18, Legistar 74911, approving the preliminary plat and final plat of the American Center East Park 5th edition on property addressed as 4846 East Park Boulevard, 17th Alder District. 
Agenda item 19, Legistar 72210, located at 1801 through 1841 Northport Drive, 12th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use and commercial corridor transitional district for a vehicle access sales and service window and consideration of a conditional use to allow construction of a new building in a planned multi-use site containing more than 40,000 square feet of floor area and where 25,000 square feet of floor area is designed or intended for retail use or for hotel or motel use, all to allow construction of a one-story coffee shop with vehicle access sales and service window. Agenda item 21, Legistar 74897, located at 2015 Winnebago Street, 6th Alder District. Consideration of a conditional use in the traditional shopping street district for a tasting room. Agenda item 23, Legistar 75243, uh, located at 3802 Galleon Run, 16th Alder District. Consideration of a conditional use in the industrial limited district for building material sales. Agenda item 24, Legistar 74900, like, located at 5978 Portage Road, Town of Burke. Approval of a certified survey map within the city's extraterritorial jurisdiction to create two lots. Uh, I will open the public hearing since there are no registrants wishing to speak. I will close the public hearing. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved by Commissioner Solheim, seconded by Alder Paulson. I will assume we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez, did you have something? Yeah, I'm sorry if, if this is out of order, space wise. I'm not asking for separation, but I do have a question about one of the items. Is that in order? Uh, go ahead. Um, item 19. Uh, I thought there were a couple of uh, comments opposing it in the record. Did those get resolved or is there something that I uh, missed? Uh, Which is the coffee shop on Northport Drive. The, you know, there were, there were a couple of comments in the record. Um, um, you know. My understanding is that all of the um, <clears throat> concerns expressed by the plan commission at the last meeting asking that those um, items be addressed have indeed been addressed. They had to do with uh, circulation, <clears throat> traffic circulation. Um, and I don't believe that there was anything else that the commission uh, expressed concern about. Is that correct, uh, Heather? It it is. I, I think there are several public comments back from August that are still on the record because that's when this was the last before the plan commission, but there aren't any new public comments um, okay. based on this version. Okay. Okay. okay thank you. Uh-huh. And we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Okay, we will move back then to the items that are not on the consent agenda. And uh, first up are items four through six, which are related and will be considered as one public hearing. Following the public hearing, the plan commission shall make separate findings and motions on each agenda item. Um, Agenda item four, Legistar 74259, located at 6604 Odana Road, 19th Alder District, consideration of a demolition permit to demolish a theater. Agenda item five, Legistar 74624, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located uh, 6604 Odana Road. 19th Alder District from Commercial Center District to Commercial Center Transitional District. Agenda item six, Legistar 74260, 
Um, same location, consideration of a conditional use in the proposed commercial corridor transitional district for a mixed use building containing greater than 60 dwelling units, consideration of a conditional use in the CCT district for a building exceeding five stories and 78 feet in height in consideration of a conditional use for a major alteration to a planned multi-use site with 40,000 square feet or more of floor area of which 25,000 square feet or more is designed as retail, a hotel or motel to allow construction of a six story mixed use building containing approximately 2,200 square feet of commercial space and 87 uh, apartments. First, we will hear um, from um, staff member uh, Tim Parks. Tim. Yes, thank you, Chair, members of the Plan Commission, Tim Parks for planning staff, uh, pinch hitting for Chris Wells tonight. The items before you uh, for 6604 Odana Road do involve the demolition of the former Market Square Theater, as well as rezoning of the property from Commercial Center District to Commercial Corridor Transitional District, and then the numerous conditional uses uh, read by the chair uh, involving the construction of a six-story mixed-use building containing 2,200 square feet of ground floor commercial space and 87 apartments. Uh, in summary, planning staff believes that the zoning map amendment and demolition standards are met, uh, but uh, did note in the staff report that careful consideration should be given uh, to uh, matters of plan consistency and whether conditional use standards 4, 9, and 12 are met. Uh, in reviewing the project, uh, staff believes uh, that the conditional use uh, is not entirely consistent with the Odana, Odana area plan, uh, which recommends five stories uh, with a sixth floor step back. Uh, however, the project is consistent with the community mixed use uh, recommendation that applies to the site and the Market Square uh, shopping center. Uh, concerns about consistency with the plan do have to do with the uh, building setback from Yellowstone Drive. Uh, however, uh, there are a number of easements that affect the placement of the building uh, that, per the applicant, uh, would not allow the building to be pulled up to the street consistent with the mixed-use recommendations uh, in the comprehensive plan, as well as the urban design recommendations in the Odana area plan. Um, Staff will note with the recent approval of the transit oriented development overlay district, uh, all of the surrounding properties and the subject site uh, are now allowed to have up to six story buildings by right. Uh, but uh, the project was submitted prior to the approval of the TOD uh, plan and is sort of a little bit in between uh, how it was reviewed because uh, transit oriented development overlay was uh, only adopted at the Common Council meeting uh, last Tuesday evening uh, and is in the process of, of taking effect. So we have to review the project uh, based on the regulations that were in place uh, when it was submitted, which were pre-TOD. Uh, so we do have to consider the height uh, recommendation here uh, because the, the TOD ordinance is not uh, yet fully in effect, uh, but will be soon. Uh, the applicant did provide shadow studies, uh, uh, which are provided in the materials uh, with the project plans uh, that show that the only time uh, that the proposed building uh, would cast shadows on neighboring buildings is late afternoon uh, during winter when shadows will cover half of the south facing facade of the adjacent Normandy Square uh, residences to the north. Uh, staff will note that the plan commission, or I'm sorry, that the Urban Design Commission reviewed uh, the project because uh, the proposed building is located in a planned multi-use site that has greater than 40,000 square feet of gross floor area, of which uh, 25,000 square feet or more are design or, designed or intended for uh, retail, hotel, or motel use. Uh, in this case, retail uh, being the rest of the Market Square uh, shopping center. Uh, the Urban Design Commission reviewed the project on January 11th, 
uh, and made a recommendation to the plan commission to approve, noting that the Urban Design Commission found that conditional use standards 9 and 12 uh, could be met, uh, that the proposal is compatible with the intended use of the neighborhood in its context, and uh, does not. And the Urban Design Commission did not find that it has a negative impact on surrounding properties. Um, so in closing, uh, if the Planning Commission can find that the standards for conditional uses are met, staff is recommending approval of the project subject to the comments and conditions uh, contained in the staff materials. Uh, and myself and Heather Stouter would be happy to answer questions uh, should the commission have any after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I will open the public hearing. The development team requested uh, a uh, pooled nine minutes. So they are, the total will be nine minutes, starting with uh, Randy Christensen, 702 uh, North High Point Road, Madison in support, wishing to speak, um, representing the development team. Randy, um, you have a combined nine minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for uh, plan commissioners um, for taking a look at this. Our development team consists of uh, myself with uh, Randy Christensen with Walter Wayne Development, Bruce Bosman, who is the ma majority owner of the Market Square Association, LLC, um, Mark Ott, our architect at JLA Architects, will be speaking about the project, John Kastner from Veerbrecker Associates, uh, we'll be here to, to answer any questions related to um, existing um, layout of the, of the site, as well as landscaping uh, thoughts uh, that, that may come about uh, if you have any questions regarding that. Um, we have had several meetings uh, regarding this project. Uh, we met with staff back in last June. And we also met with the Alder at the, at, towards the end of June of last year. The Alder conducted a uh, sponsored neighborhood meeting uh, with the neighbors in the middle of July. And we also had a, a DAT meeting on, um, in, in August, and as well as the uh, UDC uh, Urban Design Commission meetings that we've, that we've gone through. So with that, I will turn it over to Bruce Bosman to make a couple of comments. The second member of the team registered is Bruce Bosman, Commercial Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, in support and wishing to speak. Bruce? Hi, uh, committee. Um, I'm chairman of Apex Real Estate. We've owned Market Square since 2008. The theater ceased doing business in March of 2020. They resumed doing business briefly in 22. We haven't gotten any rent since March of 2020. Uh, we believe that having a, a redevelopment of this is in order since we can't find another theater that wants to take it as is. Currently, we are assessed at about $450,000 for that site. We think a new building will be assessed probably around 15 million. So I think it's in everyone's interest for us to utilize the site more effectively than what it currently is. Uh, that's it for me. Questions in the future if you have them. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, the next registrant is Mark Ott, uh, West Broadway, Monona, Wisconsin, in support wishing to speak, uh, representing Walter Wayne Development. Uh, Mark, you have the remainder of the nine minutes. Great, thanks. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. If we could go, uh, whoever's running the presentation could advance the next slide. The next slide here just shows um, basically an overview really quick of what the, you know, how the new building would sit in basically the current location of the existing uh, theater. You can go to the next slide. So as mentioned um, in the staff report and by Tim, um, here is a site plan that, that kind of merges, obviously our, our proposed layout of the building and what you see there in the red and the pink is the existing cross access easements that are in place here um, and that we've tried to work through, you know, relocating or, or moving or editing and have been unsuccessful as they are tied to other properties that are not controlled by Mr. Bosman. And so we've maximized the developable land 
and green area, as you can see. Um, it's gone through a couple of back and forth with both city staff and the UDC that we went in front of a couple of times, um, eliminating some parking to add some additional green space. Our first present, our first option here before we learned about the Cressex easements was to uh, bring that building out to Yellowstone Drive um, as you know, everybody would like and, and we would have as well. But the cross access easement that kind of runs north and south uh, parallel to Yellowstone there is what prohibited us from doing that. So um, what we the design that we did come up with in working again with UDC is um, that although this is the first um, site to be redeveloped in the market square, the proposed, you know, there is the adopted air, Odana area plan um, that talks about redevelopment of all of Odana Road. And specifically in this, um, we are looking at future redevelopment of the whole market square um, property as a whole. This just happens to be the first piece. A lot of that's tied to existing leases in some of those uh, current buildings. Um, the setup with the current drives that you see kind of in the pink and, and the one to the south there, um, with the comments and help of city staff and UDC, is those be, will be designed as basically future roads. So we've included a, a network of sidewalks around this property that have been set up like city streets with a boulevard and street trees at the request of staff and UDC um, to set up that future redevelopment and connectivity uh, for the site. So if we go to the next slide, I'll try to go through these pretty quickly. Again, this is all in your packet. This kind of shows the, the these shows the buildings in context. The proposed new building in context with the surrounding buildings. Again, uh, going back to the proposed Odana area plan, the CMU, which allows for up to calls for up to six, uh, CCT, uh, which we're asking for rezone two with five, uh, 28 feet up to six stories. Um, as Tim mentioned, the new uh, transit oriented develop, um, the TOD is coming into place. Um, so our building here is proposed at six stories. As a conditional use, but we're still coming in below the max height of 78 feet at five stories. So we're still getting that in in that max height. Um, so you can see how it sits in here. Next slide. Kind of go through these quickly. Just more images of how the building sits in the context of the surroundings. Next slide. Uh, kind of similar here. The ghosted uh, image here is the Normandy Square apartment building. Next slide. We'll go to the shadow study. So as Tim again mentioned, shadow studies are in your packet. Um, this shows four different times a year, basically every three months, and how the different shadows at different times of days move. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that really not until you get to the winter months there, which are pretty dark, um, does the building shadow start to encroach on any neighboring buildings. So for a portion of the winter um, is when you'd have that, but for the majority of the year, um, the shadows don't impact the surrounding buildings um, as we have it. So if we go to the next slide, um, so we'll just we'll end on this slide. So this is just a picture of the front of the building. Again, went through a number of, of back and forth with UDC um, to get a, a version that they were satisfied with, both from the height of six stories and the architecture um, that they felt was appropriate and sets up and meets the long-term vision of the Odana area plan. Again, we're asking for that six story as we presented that it stays below that height. Um, it works with the architecture uh, as deemed by UDC. And um, it's, like I said, still say, stay below the 78 foot um, height requirement. The step back, which is in your report as well, um, the building doesn't step back anywhere as because we're not up along the um, Yellowstone Drive. The setback is kind of created naturally by where this building sits again because of the, um, of the cross access easements that were presented. So uh, there's no step back in the building because we're using the step being or the, the sitting back off of the street face to get that relief. Um, with that, I think we, we would end our presentation and open it up for um, discussion and questions. Uh, thank you, Mark. Our next registrant is Claire Boulanger, uh, Normandy Lane, Madison, it's posed and wishing to speak. Claire, you have three minutes. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay. I would like to address this gathering in song. My name is Claire. I live in Normandy Square. Normandy Square houses seniors. We are all 55 plus. We suffer vexations from such irritations as noise, traffic, and dust. Building apartments so near us will certainly kick up some dirt. 
And after that's gone, our woes will go on because traffic and noise will still hurt. There's a lot of new housing around us, but none that so troubles our heart. This complex is close enough to us. Our new neighbors will hear when we fart. And we hope they're upwind. I will be leaving this call now. My spirits will very soon spiral. But perhaps I'll, I'll upload this on TikTok. You'll likely learn if it goes viral. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you for the unusual presentation, Claire. Um, Your words have not been getting me anywhere. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, we also have registered John Kastner, uh, West Virginia Street, Milwaukee, uh, in support, available to answer questions, um, representing, he's a civil engineer for Randy Christensen. Um, and no other registrants uh, available to answer questions. Are there any questions for any of our registrants? Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, this question would probably be for Marcotte or another member of the development team. Um, I was wondering, I noticed that there's a substantial amount of parking on the first floor. There's the lobby space and the, the retail space on the corner, but the rest of it is parking. Um, did you look at moving any of the other amenity space or having units on the first floor to activate that first floor a bit more rather than having it mostly be parking? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we did. We looked at a number of options. Um, unfortunately, to try to, you know, not have, obviously, you can see the developable land that's available um, on this and to, and to maximize the amount of green space and, and kind of the overall aesthetic and not have this ringed essentially by parking. This was kind of stuff we went back and forth with with the um, with city staff and UDC of, of reducing some of the parking that we had kind of associated directly to our site um, and, and get more so this didn't feel like a tight island. So unfortunately then to meet our parking requirements. And, and so we're using two levels of parking and a little bit of the natural grade here to get up and down <clears throat> to those. So unfortunately, and then trying to, you, you know, have some retail on the end cap there. Um, just when you, you know, the calculations of the ratios we were trying to achieve, what ended up happening is if you were to look at what becomes our second floor plan, then the amenities got kind of got kicked upstairs, if you will. Um, and then we basically added a roof deck over some of that front entry that they can feed out onto to try to activate it that way. So unfortunately, yeah, um, as the math and kind of the gymnastics worked out, it, it, we lost it on the first floor and it had to go up a level um, because we reduced the outside parking, if you will. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the two levels of parking, is there any ability to move any more of that underground or? Did you consider that? Yeah, right now, no. Um, one of the things, and I don't, uh, I'm trying to think what slide it would be the best to see it. Um, but even even in this, to try to take more um, underground, if you will, we are we have a portion of the parking that's actually built under the dry aisle, for example, the exterior along Yellowstone. So, which is more costly, you know, per square foot, if you will, than building underneath your normal building footprint. So. Even there, we tried to maximize going outside of, you know, the building footprint, if you will, to get more underground. But we've basically ran out of room even to do that. So yeah, we've we've we put as much under there as we can. Okay. Um, one more question. And I was looking at the elevations and renderings. I noticed mm -hmm. at the top with the material change that the balconies are a different color at the top, and that was something I think that was in maybe the first. UDC presentation that they asked about as well, though I, I didn't watch the full meeting, but I saw them in the notes. Has that, have you changed that at all in response to UDC feedback? Did that come up again at the second meeting? I'm just curious. No. On that. Yeah, so it came up, um, a lot of the revisions we made um, is basically just, you know, as UDC asked for in our, 
our second real heavy presentation, the first one, they requested basically more information. So our second one was the real meat and potatoes meeting where they really broke down that they requested that basically the architecture and the decks be simplified. So that's what we did. We, we took especially some of the covered decks, for example, and simplified them, bringing them further down the building so they stacked. And then to try to help with, um, to try to make some of the decks go away, if you will, we had discussed with staff, you know, we still, because of the market and that we're going after, we want a, a deck for each unit. And so what we did there was to kind of simplify it. We tied the color of the deck material. So the, as you talked about on the top of the building, for example, um, where we've got very dark gray, almost black panel that the decks and railings there are black. So they kind of fade into the background and vice versa, where we've got our white panel on the lower floors. We went with a white railing and white deck. So that was done, you know, basically in, to try to address what UDC had said. When we met with them on the final one where they, you know, before this meeting where they they gave us a, a recommendation of approval, um, it wasn't specifically brought up, uh, which I can only assume was because they were happy with it, but they didn't bring it up either pro or negative. Um, they then focused on kind of other things. So I'm hoping that the fact they didn't bring it up and they gave us a recommendation for approval meant that they liked what we did. But that was That's the background of why we did what we did. Okay. Thank you, Mark. That's all I have right now. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Solheim. Uh, Alder Hepp. Thank you. A uh, question for Mark Ott. Uh, Mark, can you um, maybe restate or uh, uh, give maybe a little more background on why you didn't incorporate the 15-foot uh, step back on the sixth floor? I I heard your mention of that, and I, I, I didn't quite grasp that. Sure. So. Um, I think though, in kind of, it's in the staff report a little bit too. The, if the building had been up along and right up against Yellowstone Drive, as you know, kind of the there's no there's no design district here, but as basically the want would be. And if we had pushed this building up against the street, then because of the height, the 15 foot setback, of course, from that kind of street edge at a certain height would have been required. But because the building is already set back. I forget what the number is. It's, it's, you know, let's say it's 50 feet. So we're not up against that street. The need for the upper level setback is not really needed because the relief gained by that setback is already gained by moving the whole building off of the street and therefore no setback on the building architecture itself. I don't know if that answers okay. all, makes it clear. So, uh, yeah, I understand the easement impacts the, the distance from Yellowstone, and you're you're saying that there is no step back requirement because you're so far back, right? Right. It's not it's not a matter of judgment. You're, it isn't even required beyond sixty feet or whatever it is. I saw that in the staff report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hmm. that's okay. Right. Thank you. That was my question. Sure. Uh, Commissioner Shepard. Hi, Mark. Could you just briefly address um, Claire's uh, concern about, again, possible possible negative impact from the construction? What efforts are you taking uh, to mitigate any problems? For example, sure. hours that you'll be, once again, construction will take place, days, those sorts of things. Sure. So um, we're working with, uh, we're looking at a couple of contractors right now that we're working with who are um, very, you know, very um, reputable and and do lots of work, especially in multifamily here in the city of Madison. And are very aware of one, both tight lots like this is um, in our you know zero staging kind of areas. So we've intentionally looked at contractors that know how to deal with that, um, as well as it's very typical, and we are assuming that it will be implemented in this project as well. To your point, um, that we have very specific hours of operation for construction that we can we can't start before and we can't. You know, we have to be done by. So um, we're anticipating that and, and our contractors are aware of how that works and monitoring that. So we'll absolutely work with the city um, ordinances and with the, with the inspection department to make sure that we're following those. Um, the, the site will be fenced. It will be, um, you know, it'll be wrapped and, and tapered off. You know, it, it is a construction site. You know, best we can do, like we said, is um, we'll have limitations to where trucks can drive. Right, um, they won't be able to drive in certain areas. They'll be limited to our construction site, um, the upkeep of it, and then the hours. So, um, both our contractors that we're currently talking to are very aware of those requirements on this site. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mark. Um, Commissioner Mendez. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Mark, probably for you, I have a question. There was a comment or two about concerns from the no ready buildings with fire EMS access um, on that south side. Can you just speak to that? Like, how would you maintain that or how, what's the plan? Sure. So um, on the south side of the building, again, that would, um, during construction, um, that'll stay open, right? I mean, like anything, you know, there might be a, a day where that would have to get temporary, get blocked. And, and again, our contractors are aware of the process to go through that. But because um, on the south side of our building specifically, right, the existing Market Square buildings get deliveries back there um, and they have doors. So that would remain open. And again, this is where the skill of our contractor working on, you know, downtown projects with zero lot lines really comes into play, which is why we're, we've selected the two that we're talking to. Um, and, and really all of the cross access easements have to maintain and stay open during construction as well. So um, emergency vehicles during this time should not be affected. The lane widths are on the easements that are recorded are those widths because they're they meet the emergency vehicle, you know, turn radiuses and, and widths. So, um, so to us, even though this is out in a, you know, if you want to kind of look at it in some regards in a parking lot on the west side, um, really the construction is almost like building in a downtown area where um, you have these zero lot lines and you have to keep everything up and open. So uh, they will not be shut off unless they go through the proper process of, you know, getting a, a day permit or whatever for the need for some reason. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Sorry, one more question for Mark. Um, related to, again, the um, parking on the first floor. So one part of, you know, not having that is activated is I'm just thinking about pedestrians experience um, at night in particular when you're surrounded by what is now a mostly vacant parking lot. Um, can you just kind of talk through um, lighting plans? There may have been a lighting plan later in the packet, but particularly for the areas where I know you have kind of the transom windows in the parking area, but mm -hmm. any lighting opportunities around there for pedestrians there, especially like on the opposite, opposite side of the building from Normandy Square? Yeah, um, so we, right now, that side, so the front side, we'll, um, we're still working on some of the details of the lighting plan. Um, the the front side will definitely be more active as that's our main entrance and um, some more of our green space out there. As far as the back side right now, again, the way we've set that up um, is the intent of that back side is to act as a city street. So we'll basically have street lighting, if you will. Um, you know, this is the first block and what hopefully over the next decade, you know, becomes redeveloped and and to treat that what's the kind of current rear rear alley, if you almost want to call it that really to set up the way we've designed the back as a city street. So you'd have city street lighting. Um, there are, again, on that backside, high transom windows. Um, the idea there is that they, would be, um, they wouldn't be blacked out, if you will, that they're above the hoods of the cars, but yet they're providing light in and then also light out so that you don't have a black backside of the building, if you will, at that level. You're going to get um, it's not, not necessarily some pedestrian activation, but you know, it should feel a little bit safer because um, it's not a, you know, it's going to have street lights and it's going to have windows um, with light on the inside. So um, that's what the current design is. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any other questions of any of our registrants? Any further questions of any of our registrants? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Are there questions of staff? Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, thank you. I've um, I've got a small question, and I'd like to do it in song. I think is that okay? <laughs> God forbid. Um, no, I'm not gonna not gonna subject our commission to that. Uh, although I did enjoy the other version of it. So this is more of a general question. I don't have a problem with this development other than where else am I going to see a movie for two bucks. But um, the, 
this is a, this was CC and it's moved to CCT, and I'm guessing that that is because that somehow allows residential mixed use or something. I, I'm not that familiar with the requirements of all these things, but what I'm what I'm expressing a concern is that this is something that was commercial, and is now, for all intents and purposes, 100% uh, residential. You know, despite some lobby and some little very tiny. Uh, commercial space. Is this what we can expect or should expect for the remainder of this redevelopment? Is this actually what um, what it we envision? Like, it looks like Heather um, would like to respond to that. Heather, go ahead, please. Sure, I can start. Great question. Um, you know, in our Odana area plan, which was recently adopted, this area was planned for uh, community mixed use, which for all intents and purposes, does support a lot of residential. Now it's flexible, it could support commercial and employment, um, but it is envisioned as a place where we would see a lot more housing. And so I think this transition into the commercial corridor transitional zoning district um, and into a mixed use building that's predominantly residential is consistent with, with what the plan really lays out for this broader area. And so I think as this broader site continues to, to redevelop, uh, we may see a similar mix where we see you know predominantly residential uses. I think an important thing to remember is that we have a lot of retail nearby with the the mall just to the west. And um, I think you know the Odana plan, plan a, a central tenant of it was really trying to open up this area for um, a lot of housing. Thank you, Heather. Uh, are there further questions of staff? Further questions of staff? Okay, then we will need um, three separate motions. The first one is on the uh, demolition permit. Do we have a motion? Commissioner Solheim. Okay, we all miss Brad, so I will go for this. Um, I will move that the Planning Commission find that the standards for demolition permits are met and approve the demolition of the building at 6604 Odana Road. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Mendez. Uh, uh, Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Not this, thanks. Okay. Um, any comments or input from any commissioners? Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, motion passes unanimously. Then the next item is uh, the change in zoning agenda item five. Do we have a motion for that? Commissioner Solheim. I will move that the Planning Commission forward zoning, the zoning map amendment to rezone 6604 Odana Road from CC to CCT to the council with a recommendation of approval. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Mendez. Uh, Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Um, I'll wait till the last one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any. Um, Comments, input. I see no raised hand, so we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Um, the final uh, motion we need is related to the conditional use, agenda item six. Do we have a motion? Commissioner Solheim. I will move that the Planning Commission finds that the standards for conditional use are met and approve um, the building in the CCT district uh, containing, sorry, I gotta scroll down here for the rest of this, for a mixed use building containing greater than 60 units um, in a planned multi-use site with 40,000 square feet or more floor area of which 25,000 square feet or more is designed as retail in order to allow for the construction of a six-story mixed-use building at 
6604 Odana Road. Uh, did you mention that? Subject to the conditions in the staff report, including the UDC recommendations. Thank you, Chair Zeller. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Seconded by Commissioner Mendez. Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Um, yeah, just briefly, I'll say um, this is a, a great infill site. It'll be nice to see some additional housing to pair. Um, with the adjacent Normandy Square building. I do feel for those residents, but um, you know, shadows are, are part of our redevelopment. Uh, they are not uh, guaranteed in our, in our city. And this does, um, for the most part, conform with our plans. I do wish that we could have more street activation. I think there's been a lot of improvements to um, the front area, particularly facing Yellowstone and the Normandy Square building. Um, I, I hope there can be maybe some additional lighting and landscaping to make it a little more pedestrian friendly around there as we see the rest of the site um, improve and be redeveloped. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Spencer. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I agree with the notions about lighting and making it more pedestrian friendly. Um, but I do feel better about supporting this proposed development because of the, not just because of the improvements on Odana Road that the city has made. Um, there's been a, a, I guess, a road diet made to that. It went from two lanes and then um, to one lane with left turn and bike lane. So I was really happy to see that. I think it's improved this traffic in that area and the safety in that area. So maybe with more redevelopment in that area, we'll see more uh, street activation and pedestrian amenities and bicycle amenities. Okay. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Spencer. Any other comments, uh, input before we come to a vote? Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next items are agenda item 11 and 12. Um, agenda item 11, Legistar 73382, located at 4205 Portage Road, 17th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the traditional residential urban district for a multifamily dwelling with greater than 60 dwelling units, consideration of a conditional use in the TRU1 district for a residential building complex and consideration of a conditional use in that same district for outdoor recreation to allow construction of approximately 485 apartments in five buildings with outdoor recreation. Agenda item 12, uh, Legistar 73801, approving a certified survey map of property owned by Hidden Creek Holdings, LLC, uh, same address, 17th Alder District. And first we will hear from planning staff, Tim Parks. Tim. Thank you, Chair, members of the commission. Uh, two items before the body tonight. The first, uh, various conditional uses related to the development of an approximately 11 and a half acre parcel located on the east side of Portage Road on the north side of DeLoretto Avenue uh, to construct 483 uh, apartment units and five buildings uh, with uh, outdoor recreation, uh, including a pickleball court and pool. Uh, there's also a one-story uh, leasing office and commons building on the eastern site. Uh, also before the plan commission tonight is a uh, request to divide the same property into four lots. Uh, for uh, to facilitate the development. Uh, the uh, proposal calls for the dedication of a 66 foot wide public street uh, shown conceptually as West Creekwood Lane uh, that will separate uh, the, the site into uh, roughly a 4060 proposition with two lots between the new North South Street and Portage Road on which two of the proposed buildings will be built and then two lots on the east side of the new road uh, between uh, that road and the interstate, which forms the eastern boundary of the site on which the uh, remaining three buildings as well as the commons building will be constructed. 
uh, planning staff has reviewed uh, the conditional use and supplemental regulations for residential building complexes and believes that the plan commission may find that the standards are met. Uh, the project is generally consistent with the Hanson Neighborhood Development Plan as it was amended in 2021, uh, calling for housing mix four, uh, which is the densest, highest intensity uh, rec uh, residential uh, recommended in the Hanson Neighborhood Plan, uh, and that applies to proposed lots one and two uh, adjacent to Portage Road. Uh, and uh, the project, while not entirely consistent with the uh, slightly less intense housing mix three that's recommended east of the new North South Street, uh, staff will, will note that the proposed height of uh, the three buildings east of the new street is consistent with the TRU1 district uh, and staff is not in opposition. Uh, in general, uh, we are recommending approval subject to the uh, comments and conditions uh, in the staff report. Uh, and we also recommend approval of the four lot certified survey map, uh, noting that the conditions of approval for the land division are found on page 16 of the staff report. Uh, the conditions for the conditional uses on page eight and also in the one page addendum that was sent to the plan commission earlier today that included a condition from the forestry section uh, that was inadvertently left out of the staff report that was posted at the end of last week for the project. So with that, uh, staff is recommending approval of both requests subject to conditions, and we would be happy to answer any questions after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We do have one registrant uh, wishing to speak, Nick Patterson. My understanding is representing T. Wall uh, the developer. Um, Nick, you have three minutes. Yes, thank you. I'll just give a high level overview of the project and then I can take any questions you may have. And then I also have Patrick Terry from JLA and Jonathan Lilly from Veer Bicker here as well to answer any questions. So if you would go to page two of the presentation, please. So here's the site plan. So the development will contain five multifamily buildings and one clubhouse. We position the buildings to frame the streets and better activate the streets. We have additional walkout units located along De Loretto and also on West Creekwood Lane on buildings A, B, and C. The development will have a total of 483 units ranging from studios that uh, are very popular with young professionals and empty nesters to three bedroom units that are more popular for larger families. Some of the various amenities in this development include electric vehicle charging stations will have approximately 10% uh, of the underground stalls will have electric vehicle charging stations and then secured bike storage, uh, recreational areas, as Tim said, and then a centralized clubhouse. And then this development will be heavily landscaped with a variety of plant life. I think it's worth noting that the our landscape architect got creative with the existing spruce trees on site, and we're actually able to reuse most of the existing spruce trees, and we will incorporate them into the development. We will transplant the trees onto the edge of the property to frame the new bike path. <clears throat> and then in regard to the landscape plan, we are proposing a washed stone mulch in the planting beds as we found that this is the safest and most efficient way to maintain those uh, landscaping beds. Uh, this will be a pet friendly property and let's face it, our pets eat things and get into things that they shouldn't. Dogs eat, eat wood mulch and wood mulch is poisonous. In most cases it is treated. And also in a rainfall occurrence, wood mulch washes away into the streets and sewers and then into the lakes. Stone mulch does not. So in closing, I request the Plan Commission remove the condition to require wood mulch. The council revoked the original ordinance back in 2018 and have since then adopted an ordinance allowing for stone mulch. So again, I request that the Plan Commission remove the condition of wood mulch. Thank you for your time and I'm available for any questions. Hey, thank you. Uh, the other two registrants are Jonathan Lilly. Um, 
Fourier Drive, Madison, um, available to answer questions representing the project from Beerbecker and Patrick Terry, uh, West Broadway, Monona in support, also not wishing to speak, but available to answer a question, uh, also representing the um, developer. Are there any questions of any of our registrants? Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, thank you. Question for Nick Patterson. Uh, first of all, if you could, uh, on the drawing, point out to me the new bike path. <clears throat> but also, if my memory serves me, and it doesn't always that well, uh, this was once envisioned as a potential location for a bike pedestrian overpass of the interstate. Uh, has that been eclipsed by this development, or is there is that still uh, under consideration? Nick? Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure planning staff could better answer the um, underpass, but as far as the new bike path is along the north and east side of the property, right there along, um, yep, yep, right there. Where did... And that will link to the existing bike path that's at uh, Hidden Creek Residence to the south. Okay, thank you. Did you have anything further, Commissioner Fernandez? Uh, no, I may have the same question of staff, though. Okay, very good. Uh, Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, Nick, just a quick question for you. Uh, you mentioned electrical vehicle charging stations. Was that 10% figure uh, EV ready or EV installed? <clears throat> Yeah, the electric vehicle charging stations, they'll be, um, it'll be approximately 10% EV ready. We will install more conduit and basically have the capacity to have uh, more than 10%, but it will be, um, it, it will be as the market demands for those elect for additional electric vehicle stalls. So the actual installed and functioning will be the 2% that the city requires? Yes, yeah, we'll be exceeding that 2%. Initially, you will be exceeding that 2%. Yes, correct. And the, and you'll have initially the capability to expand to 10%. Uh, no, sorry. So we, up front, we will have installed approximately 10% active, ah. ready to go. Um, we will have the conduit and the capacity for above 10% for in the future as market demands it. Uh, that's what I was hoping for. Thank you. Yep. Good. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mendez. Thank you, Chair. Um, Nick, can you tell me where in the plans the EV stalls are? I, don't, I didn't see them on the plan, so maybe I just missed it. I would have to, let me pull up the plan, or it may be in the presentation here. Um, I don't know are if they in the, quite are that. They in the garage or in the surface lot? Oh, yeah, sorry. They'll be in the underground parking. I don't know if it's labeled on this. Just this isn't usually the level of detail that we typically have that. But um, no, I don't I don't see it here. But um, but yeah, we'll we'll have approximately 10% installed um typically it'll be uh it'll be an ev station in between stalls that will serve two stalls okay thank you any further questions of any of our registrants seeing none i'll close the public hearing are there questions of staff Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, thanks. So I will ask that question of staff. Is there any, um, was there any consideration or is there ongoing discussion of a uh, crossing of the, of the interstate in this approximate location? Tim? Gen yeah, generally, thank you. Uh, generally speaking, yes. Uh, there is an underpass of the interstate that would uh, link this site into the western edge of the American Center. 
uh, that's planned. Uh, my recollection, and I apologize, I'm caught a little flat-footed on that. I was trying to look up uh, some information uh, whether there was anything in place. Now there is currently uh, a utility crossing of the interstate just south of De Loretto Avenue. I think the plan is for there to be uh, uh, that underpass to, to be built in the future. Uh, and there may be some infrastructure in place for that uh, crossing to occur, but there's nothing in existence yet. And I'm not aware of anything uh, forthcoming uh, right now. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, Alter Madison. Oops, and thank you. I am trying to uh, multitask right now. So my apologies if I missed the moment to ask this question, but I know in speaking with um, Nick earlier and uh, with planning, there was a question around mulch and this approval. Um, and so I just wanted to, at least we come back to address that with the, to get that condition removed and just kind of hear the commission's perspective on that, I guess. Um, so did you have a question of staff related to the mulch? Yeah. So I got a question earlier from Nick. I chatted with Kevin Furchild from planning around the issue of whether or not there was an, a question around the legality of um, having the mulch in the approval. Um, and it didn't seem to be that there was an issue. There was not a legal issue. And so I just want to make sure before this part of it is wrapped up that if there was still a question of this mulch being wood or stone mulch, having that part addressed. Um, okay, I see that uh, Heather has uh, a comment about that. Sure, I, I, I think what you said, Alder Madison, is, is correct. Uh, we don't have any legal concerns about the plan commission uh, conditioning approval on, on this project, having, having bark mulch. Similarly, the plan commission could theoretically condition the approval on, on having stone mulch as, as part of the landscape requirement. Um, but what this is, is a recommendation from our city's urban design commission, and they have purview over uh, design details of the building and the site, including the landscaping. And their rationale uh, for this recommendation is that the bark mulch will be more, more well suited to the plantings themselves. And so, you know, the, their recommendation is really uh, is really along the lines of what they think is a, a healthier environment for the plantings that are, are proposed to, to thrive in this location. Um, you've heard from the applicant that their concern is that uh, bark mulch may be eaten by pets who, who live at the apartment uh, complex. And I just wanna stress that I think either way the plan commission goes on this, there's no legal concern. Um, you know, you've heard the Urban Design Commission's recommendation and the rationale for it either type of mulch is allowable in our zoning code. Um, and so the plan commission should you know, make it clear whether that condition is included or if, if the plan commission um, is, is willing as the applicant requests to remove that condition, just make that clear so that we as staff can, can make sure that we know uh, and the applicant knows what to expect moving forward. Great, thank you, Heather. Are there further questions of staff? Alder Paulson. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. Uh, I didn't watch the UDC uh, uh, discussion of this, so I don't know the full details of kind of their mulch discussion. Um, is this something? Uh, did the uh, dog eating uh, dogs eating mulch question come up at the UDC? Did they consider that as part of their discussion? Uh, Heather or Tim, do you know? I I don't I don't recall. Uh, I'll only, you know, add some color that the Urban Design Commission has long been opposed to stone mulch, uh, but as Heather pointed out, uh, it's certainly approvable by the, the zoning code, which until 2018 uh, did not allow stone mulch, uh, but now does uh, under conditions that there be weed mat underneath it. Uh, but stone mulch uh, is allowable now, uh, but the Urban Design Commission, uh, consistent with, you know, longstanding uh, philosophy, uh, just doesn't, you know, support it in pretty much all cases. 
Thank okay. you, Tim. Thank you. Did you have anything further, Alder Paulson? No. Okay. I'm good for uh, now. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, uh, we'd be looking for a motion. Commissioner Solheim. I will move that the plan commission find that the standards for conditional use are met and approve construction of a residential building complex containing 483 apartments uh, at 4205 Portage Road, subject to the conditions uh, in the staff report and from UDC with the exception um, of the mulch condition, I would remove the stone mulch condition from my motion. Um, so uh, uh, allowing for stone mulch. Allowing for, so yes, allowing for stone mulch. Okay, is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Shepard. Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Um, I'll I'll just make one comment on uh, the mulch uh, change is that I just feel for um, consistency. I don't really like, you know, allowing uh, different types of mulch for projects that don't go before UDC and then sometimes having it as a condition and sometimes not. I think it's fairly inconsistent and um, there's some good reasonings on a residential building in particular to have that. So that's the reason I would like to remove that condition. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Solheim. Any mm -hmm. other discussion of the motion before we come to a vote? Alder Paulson. Yeah, so I also wanna respect the uh, judgment of the. Uh, UDC uh, and let them be able to, to have this. So I would support uh, perhaps an amendment and maybe I will suggest one uh, and staff can stop me if this is not in order, if this is going to make things more difficult um, uh, for uh, the UDC to, to, to support this, but make the condition uh, for mulch uh, allow the applicant to go back to the UDC for uh, a discussion uh, in final approval on the mulch question separate, though I'm not sure procedurally if that means that I just slowed the whole project down. I don't want to I don't want to delay everything by three weeks for for the mulch question, but if they can if council can take this up um, and and have final approval with the understanding that um, things can get started with the mulch question going back for one last discussion at at UDC. So your motion is, to require um, the applicant to go back to UDC to have the question of bark or stone mulch resolved. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Is seconded by Alder Heck? Did I get a second? Yes, okay, seconded by Alder Heck. Uh, did you wish to speak to your um, motion, Alder Paulson? Um, yes, again, uh, I think that uh, UDC uh, considers this and, and I think it's uh, in the domain of UDC to make these sorts of decisions. Uh, and so I, I'm hesitant to take it off uh, from, from their discussion. I would appreciate any staff insights uh, uh, on what I just did to the approval process, because uh, I don't want this to stop at plan, have to come back to plan and go to council. I'm hoping this can be simply sort of a, uh, council can approve it, but um, the applicant can go back for a final resolution on this one remaining question. Tim? Yes, with all due respect, Alder, I, I don't know if that will get anything accomplished. I think the Urban Design Commission's recommendation is, is pretty clear and evident to the Planning Commission that they don't believe stone mulch would be appropriate. And sending it back uh, for them to debate it further, I don't think will accomplish much other than perhaps uh, increase frustration by both members of the Urban Design Commission and potentially the development team. And so I, I think the, the question has been laid before the plan commission, wood mulch or stone mulch? Uh, and while I appreciate uh, trying to uh, be deferential to the Urban Design Commission, 
um, I, I don't see that it'll be a, a fulsome conversation. So um, thank you for considering those thoughts. Okay. Um, thank you, Tim. Um, with that, um, yes, uh, Alder Heck, did you wish to speak? Yes, a question for staff, please, on this amendment. Um, I, I, I would, if if this were to pass, would it be appropriate for it not to come back to plan commission? Uh, is that something that we can decide, or would it necessarily need to come back to plan commission uh, if <clears throat> after the UDC negotiation? I guess I'll call it. The the project basically has been reviewed by the Urban Design Commission. They've made their recommendation uh, on the residential building complex uh, as provided by code. Uh, this is not a project uh, that falls neatly on the uh, traditional initial approval, final approval spectrum. Uh, we're actually trying to, for projects that the Urban Design Commission is making an advisory recommendation to the Plan Commission, uh, trying to make that recommendation uh, clear and as much a once and for all sort of affair as possible. Uh, so, you know, in the absence of what we anticipate would be a rare circumstance where the Urban Design Commission says, yes, but we need to see it again in the future, uh, kind of more like that we'll give it initial, but uh, it needs to come back for final. In this case, they've said their piece on it. And so sending it back to the Urban Design Commission for further discussion, uh, I, I, I guess we would have to preserve the opportunity for uh, the, the project to come back to uh, the plan commission who has the ability to uh, approve the conditional use if there was still disagreement over whether the project should have wood mulch or stone mulch. And I don't know, I would certainly defer to, to Heather if she has a, a, another opinion on that. Heather? I, I have the same opinion, but I wanted to, to just clarify that this project, uh, other than the certified survey map associated with the project, doesn't go to the Common Council. So there's no other step for it after this. The Plan Commission's decision this evening on the conditional use for 483 units is the final step, um, except for, again, the, the certified survey map to split the property into four lots. So I just wanted to share that clarification that there's not like another step waiting that you could weave in another trip to the Urban Design Commission um, before. And it sounded like perhaps Alder Paulson, when you were making that uh, motion to amend, that that was the assumption that it still needed to go to council. Uh, Alder uh, Heck, did you have anything further? No. Okay, Alder Paulson. Yeah, but light of staff uh, input here and some clarifications, perhaps if there's no objection from the body, we could withdraw my first motion or my, my proposed amendment and I could make a separate amendment. Um, it is uh, in the purview of the body since it was moved and seconded. Um, without objection, we will uh, withdraw it. Is there any objection to Alder Paulson? Alder Heck, are you okay with that too? Okay. Okay, so there was no objection from the body. Okay, okay. Alder Paulson? Yeah, I'd like to make a much simpler motion, which is to uh, amend uh, Commissioner Solheim's uh, uh, proposal, but to uh, leave the, um, but to add back in the UDC recommend the UDC condition of uh, bark mulch instead of uh, instead of stone mulch. Okay, so your motion is to uh, leave in the requirement that it be um, bark rather than stone mulch. Correct. Is okay, yes. is there a second? Seconded by Alder Heck. Uh, did you wish to speak to your motion, Alder Paulson? No, I've already explained it. So okay. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Seeing none, we will come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Uh, Commissioner Solheim, excuse me, Commissioner Mendez uh, are voting against that amendment.
Okay, the amendment passes. <laughs> Excuse me. Now we will come back to the main motion, uh, which does require the bark mulch. And we, any comments at all on the main motion? Seeing none, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, that motion passes unanimously. Now we need uh, a motion on the certified survey math agenda item 12. Commissioner Solheim. I will move that the plan commission forward the certified survey map to divide 4205 Portage Road into four lots to the common council with a recommendation of approval subject to the conditions in the staff report. Uh, is there a second? And uh, seconded by Commissioner Mendes. Uh, Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? No, no thank you. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone have any comments about this motion? Commissioner Fernandez. I do, thank you. Um, staff, could you briefly explain what is accomplished by creating four lots here? I mean, I, I guess I assume two lots have to be because you're putting a street through the middle of it. Um, but- Ten? I, I don't quite understand what purpose is being served here, particularly because there's one common building for all of this. Um, and I also, I forgot to look closely at the access issues, but I assume that that this does not create any access issues, but I, I don't quite understand why, um, what purpose is served in making these separate properties. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's the purview of the developer uh, to break the property into uh, different parcels for financing purposes. That's uh, very common, quite honestly, uh, when you have a phased development uh, where you may have different lenders working on different parts of the project, uh, all potentially looking for some collateral in terms of underlying land. Uh, it allows for phasing of some improvements uh, that may not be as much the case here uh, because uh, there will be an expectation to uh, finish De Loretto Avenue uh, with this project and also to dedicate and construct uh, the new North-South Street, including the temporary cul-de-sac and the water and sewer pipes, et cetera, that are customarily part of uh, subdivision infrastructure. Uh, but uh, it, you know, that's that's conjecture on my part. Uh, I certainly don't want to speak on behalf of the development team. Uh, but, you know, it is not uncommon for uh, projects of, a significant, of, of substantial enough size uh, like this one uh, with a lot of complexity to be broken into multiple phases onto multiple lots uh, for those reasons that I mentioned. Thank you, Tim. Just a, a quick follow-up, Tim. That, that, that was very, very much to the point of what I was asking, but does that mean the possibility is here for, say, one or more of these buildings to be developed without the public improvement of that street? That's something that uh, will be worked out uh, following uh, the presumptive approval of the project, uh, especially with the certified survey map. There'll be uh, scheduling meeting with the city engineering division uh, that uh, will begin to spec uh, when certain improvements are going to happen, how the project's going to be phased, uh, will there be one subdivision improvement contract or developer's agreement mm -hmm. uh, with the team for the whole project or somehow some of the stuff going to be phased. And that will uh, ultimately be approved through the Board of Public Works and the Common Council before construction can can start before in can earnest. Start. Okay, Th that totally satisfies me. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will come to a vote, and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Our next uh, item is agenda item 20, 
uh, Legistar 75171, creating sections of the Madison General Ordinances to change the zoning of property located at 6853 McKee Road, 7th Alder District from uh, Plan Development, General Development Plan District to amended um, PDGDP um, District. Uh, we will first hear from uh, Tim Parks. Tim. Hello again, uh, Chair and members of the Commission. Item number 20 is a request to amend a general development plan for a roughly six and a half acre parcel uh, generally located at the southwestern corner of Maple Grove Drive and McKee Road, uh, of which the uh, project team did correctly note uh, after the publishing of my report, only 3.82 acres of which are actually uh, being developed. That is the roughly rectangular portion of the subject site bounded by McKee Road on the north, Maple Grove on the east, Mater Drive on the south, and Golden Copper Lane on the west. Uh, but the, the overall property uh, includes an appendage that uh, swings to the southwest and includes some stormwater management ponds uh, private stormwater management ponds uh, located on both sides of Mater Drive, west of Golden Copper. So the whole thing is six and a half acres, but we're really primarily focused on the 3.8 acres or so uh, located uh, adjacent to the Maple Grove McKee intersection. Um, the project is before the Planning Commission for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the general development plan last approved for the site was approved by the Common Council and in March of 2010. And the zoning code requires uh, that any plan development not constructed in accordance to an approved phasing plan and any phases not constructed within 10 years of the Common Council approval of the general development plan shall require approval of a new general development plan by the Common Council following a recommendation by the Plan Commission. Uh, so uh, here we are uh, with a project that was submitted in uh, November 2022. Uh, a full two and a half years or, or more uh, past the expiration of the 10 years uh, from that March 2010 uh, council approval of the last general development plan for the site. Uh, so we essentially need to give a new general development plan approval for uh, the this property. Uh, there's also some significant differences uh, between what was approved for the site in 2010 and what is before the body tonight. Uh, and there's also changes to the zoning text uh, for the, the project uh, to potentially add some uses to the allowed uses for this particular plan development uh, that are not uh, otherwise uh, allowed in the zoning text that was approved in 2010. Uh, the planning staff uh, has reviewed the project closely. Uh, and, and we'll note that uh, there are some aspects of the project that we feel the plan commission should give uh, consideration to. Uh, the, the project has two major components uh, on the amended general development plan, the first of which on the eastern roughly 60% of the site closest to Maple Grove Drive. Uh, there is a proposal for what is effectively a single three-story mixed-use building that is that will actually appear uh, from most sides as two three-story wings, uh, buildings A1 and A2, uh, which will contain approximately 2,500 square feet of uh, ground floor commercial space uh, near the southeastern corner of the site adjacent to the Mater Drive, Maple Grove Drive intersection. Uh, the rest of uh, the building A1, building A2 project is 120 units of multifamily housing. The remainder of the site west of uh, the A1, A2 building or buildings, uh, if you will, uh, is a proposal for a one to two story up to 10,000 square foot commercial building uh, that'll be placed uh, up along the McKee Road uh, portion of the property uh, with a surface parking lot uh, extending south from that building. Uh, and that will comprise the remainder of the area subject to the general development plan amendment. Uh, in general, the, the two three-story buildings, uh, A1 and A2, are generally consistent with the uh, neighborhood mixed use uh, recommended for the site by the comprehensive plan. 
as noted in the staff report, the, uh, the site is located within the cross country neighborhood development plan. Uh, however, that plan is approximately 30 years old and the recommendations for the site are, are a fair bit out of date in terms of recommending a commercial office for the site. Uh, back when this was going to be a medical office campus uh, in the mid 1990s. Uh, that plan has not been uh, updated really substantially since the late 1990s uh, and uh, won't be updated until this area is uh, taken a look at as part of the area planning effort for the Southwest Zone Area 4, uh, which we hope will, will take place in 2024. Uh, so we are really relying on the comp plan recommendations for the site, which are, as I mentioned, neighborhood mixed use, uh, which would generally recommend two to four story mixed use buildings. Uh, the commercial market would primarily be uh, geared towards uh, neighborhood serving uh, commercial uses, among other things. Uh, in general, buildings A1 and A2 are, are fairly consistent with that idea uh, and, and plan recommendation. However, uh, staff uh, doesn't believe that the one to two story commercial building proposed uh, west of buildings A1 and A2 is, is entirely consistent with what you would expect to see in a neighborhood mixed use area as recommended in uh, any of our adopted plans since uh, 2006. Uh, so uh, that is why the staff's recommendation is as it is if the plan commission feels that what's before you uh, can meet that neighborhood mixed use recommendation. Uh, that is certainly an option the plan commission has before it. Uh, staff is recommending uh, approval subject to some fairly detailed conditions. Uh, those conditions are, are generally consistent with the uh, Urban Design Commission's recommendation on the plan development. Urban Design Commission saw the project at their January 11th meeting uh, and recommended uh, that uh, the standalone commercial building on the western portion of the site uh, if not a full two-story building, uh, be designed to have uh, the appearance of or architecture of a two-story building, uh, which would primarily be the mass uh, of the building appearing as though it's more than a one-story building. Uh, and also uh, looking for ways to uh, reduce the amount of surface parking uh, that you see there. Uh, not just specific to the one-story commercial building on the western portion of the site, but just in general, uh, for example, between buildings A1 and A2, uh, or uh, at the northwestern corner of the uh, western building, uh, uh, that there'd be opportunities to potentially reduce the amount of surface parking uh, and increase uh, open space for the project. Uh, staff is generally supportive uh, of those recommendations, uh, and they are, are amplified somewhat in the recommend uh, uh, the staff recommended conditions uh, from the planning division. Uh, we also uh, want to really emphasize the need for the future buildings uh, to be as oriented to uh, the abutting streets as they are to uh, uh, any parking areas. Uh, we want the, the buildings to be oriented in particular to McKee Road and Maple Grove Drive uh, with active entrances to the buildings, um, including uh, entrances to ground floor uh, residential units. Uh, and that would also apply to the, the standalone commercial building, uh, which we feel needs to have an active entrance uh, from either Golden Copper or McKee Road, uh, not just uh, from the parking area located to itself. So with that, uh, that'll conclude my, my staff comments and I'd be happy to answer questions after the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I will open the public hearing. The first registrant is Alex Weiss, uh, Harbert Drive, Madison in support, wishing to speak. Um, and I believe that he is the property owner or representing the property owner, but uh, Alex, if you could confirm, you've got three minutes. That is correct. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Alex Wise. I'm one of the owners of the property, as was just mentioned. Uh, and I, first thing I want to do is thank the staff uh, for all the time and attention and assistance and guidance and direction we've been given up to this point. It's been a long road. Uh, so thanks, everyone. You know who you are. Uh, then I want to go through a quick history of the property. 
we have owned it since 2005, me and my partners. And uh, we bought 10 acres from Dean Medical at that time. As Tim mentioned, the, the property was, I don't know if it was planned or zoned. I think it was might have been agricultural when we bought it, but it was going to be a medical campus. It was owned by Dean Medical. Uh, we are Dean's landlord on uh, the Beltline at their corporate office which hopefully in a couple of years here will be in front of you again to redevelop that property for SSM, Dean. Uh, anyway, we bought it in 2005 with plans to do a grocery anchored shopping center there with uh, associated neighborhood retail. That never really came together. In 2007, we purchased another three and a half acres just to the north along Maple Grove. Uh, in 2010, we got the property zoned to GDP. SIP, some of the uses which have been developed since. In 2012, we sold three acres to TR McKenzie for an addition to the, their company's Stone Creek apartment project that is to the south end of the site. In 2015, we sold three acres to Oak Brook for uh, Maple Grove Commons apartment project. And I think you're starting to see a trend here. We thought we were going to have retail and uh, maybe some associated service commercial at the property. We never felt a lot of demand for that. In 2020, the GDP expired, as Tim explained. Thank you, Tim. In late 2020, we began talking with Tim and the staff about rezoning the property, and that brings us to today. So a lot of time and effort has gone into the plans that you uh, have in your packet, and I wanna now introduce our architect and our engineer, Joe Lee with JLA Architects is our architect and he's gonna bring you through the project and Bruce Holler, our civil engineer who has been working on this land uh, as long as I have. Since 2005, Bruce is here to answer questions if necessary. With that, uh, I'll hand it over to Joe, thank you. Um, our second registrant is Joe Lee in support wishing to speak representing Livesey Company. Joe, you've got three minutes. Okay, great. Um, is somebody going to share the the documents, Tim or Heather, or no? Great, thanks, Tim. Um, I'll give a brief overview um, of the project here. As you can see, um, I just want to um, point out that we are seeking a, a GDP amendment on approval, and um, we will subsequently uh, be back in front of not only this body, the Plan Commission, uh, at a future date, but also the Urban Design Commission as we move through the SIP uh, process for, um, for developing this, this parcel further. So what you see here is uh, the conceptual layout of the site and um, the development proposal, um, but acknowledging there's much design to be uh, done um, on this project still. So as you see here, um, as Tim had pointed out, this is a mixed use uh, project and uh, this parcel here that's colored uh, will be divided into two uh, separate parcels on the west. Um, we are proposing a single story uh, commercial building uh, with um, the, the use uh, yet to be determined. Um, but in our many meetings with, with staff and the Alder and the UDC, um, this is the resulting development pattern of the building uh, as far as placement and orientation, um, which is along McKee Road with parking, uh, associated parking behind it. Um, you know, the amount of parking and, and the uh, layout of the parking will be determined and presented uh, to this body at a future date when, when that's determined and we come back um, uh, for the SIP. Um, I, I do want to note that um, we are asking respectfully uh, for the condition of this building being a two-story building uh, be removed. Uh, we we are fine with exploring, as the UDC has recommended, um, a one-story building that has some mass, it has some volume, and presents a little taller than a, a normal one-story building. But we do feel that requiring two-story buildings is is just going to hamper uh, the potential development of the site, and it will 
uh, continue to sit vacant for a while uh, due to the market conditions. Um, so that's one thing. On the east eastern side of this parcel, uh, Maple Grove and McKee Road, you see what Tim was describing there, buildings A1 and A2. Uh, that's effectively a single building. There will be one level of underground parking that will serve um, those buildings. And on the south eastern corner of the parcel at Mater Drive and Maple Grove Drive, we do have um, about 2,500 square foot of commercial, which will have a double story uh, height. So it'll be um, a, a nice present there on the that, street. That concludes your available time. Thank you. Uh, the next registrant is uh, Angie Black, West Washington Avenue, Madison in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Robert Zanowski, JLA Architects, Broadway, um, Monona, Wisconsin, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing JLA Architects. Uh, Bruce Holler, uh, Westward Way, Madison, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions representing Livesey Company. Uh, those are our registrants. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, a question probably for Jolie. Um, I was wondering if you had considered connecting the two buildings along McKee to kind of create a stronger street edge. I see that the buildings are connected via the underground parking to create a U in the underground parking. Uh, just curious why that wasn't replicated for the stories above. Right. That, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this. It was gonna be something I mentioned um, as I continued. Um, we were, we've been in front of the Urban Design Commission a couple of times, um, two or three, uh, at least two. And this was, this was a, uh, an issue that they specifically brought up. And at the end of the day, uh, they specifically, uh, debated and, and, and moved to recommend, recommend, uh, the development pattern as shown here. Um, we did look at it. We looked at multiple different building organizations, which, probably don't have time to, to get into now, but um, we really feel that um, because of the site access, uh, the mix of uses and breaking up the parking fields, uh, that this development pattern where the buildings placed as they are and oriented as they are, um, presented the nice, a nice streetscape um, and was the most uh, beneficial for the use and accessibility of, of this development. So, um, so that's that's the reason for the orientation and the placement of the buildings on site. And urban design uh, didn't have a problem with it at the end of the day. Okay, I mean it, it seems odd to me because usually having parking underneath a space when you don't have building above it is quite inefficient. Um, but I, one other layout question: uh, the commercial space that's in the residential building. Um, I would have expected to see that on McKee, but it's on Mater. And I see that there's other commercial space on the other side of that street. Have, have you considered moving that at all? Or is there a reason it's in that, in that side versus on McKee? Yep, thanks for that question as well. Um, along with building placement and orientation, you know, the, the placement of the different uses, uh, we looked at multiple options. This site is unique in a couple of ways. Um, Number one, the, the, the access allowed um, onto the site from McKee um, and from Maple Grove is restricted. So there's no access, no curb cuts allowed um, on, on, that, on those streets. So the, the only access to the site, vehicular access, um, is off of Mater. Um, sec secondarily, um, there's quite a bit of topography change, grade change, going from the northeast to the southwest, uh, the grade drops um, eight to 10 feet. So there's really some logistics with um, creating that mixed use building access to the, 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 um, the commercial space um, and, and uh, both pedestrian and, and vehicular. So really um, the only viable spot 
uh, for that retail would be where we're showing it at at the intersection of Mater or at, at the southwest uh, southeast I'm sorry uh, corner of the site um, and, and the demand as as uh, Alex had said um, isn't there for a greater a greater uh, quantity of of commercial retail on that on that portion of the site because of it okay. Thank you. So I have one more question. Um, I see that the amenity space then like club room and fitness is in one building. Will residents of the other building have access to that? Yep, absolutely. And, and again, that's uh, this is in conceptual design right now. So um, as we develop the design a little, some of those uses might go to the other side, the other building. Um, that outdoor space that you mentioned earlier between the two buildings is a common outdoor amenity space. Um, so there might be some synergies if we break that both that indoor common space up a little bit. Um, but that's something we got to figure out as as we uh, develop the design of the building itself. Um, and I would I would mention that uh, Tim mentioned a condition of um, reducing some of the parking. We are we are open to that. The urban design. Um, did specifically talk about um, the area between the the multifamily building and the the single story commercial building where we have parking that that goes along the whole length. They specifically mentioned maybe making that a little more green. And as we develop the design, we're definitely going to look into that because because we think that's a that's a good idea. As long as we can hit our Thank ratios. You. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alder Heck. Thank you. This is also for Joe Lee. Um, Joe, you you mentioned that you were concerned about a requirement to have a, a two-story structure on that uh, commercial-only uh, lot. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? And uh, I mean, is, are, is the fear that uh, it it wouldn't be rentable uh, based on assuming that it's the same tenant wrote uh, and the same uses on both floors. Or um, I guess I, I want to hear you back up that fear a little bit uh, because uh, this isn't going to be the last time you're going to have this requirement in the city. As as you probably sure. know, we're we're moving more towards uh, two story buildings rather than one. Right, and um, thanks for that question. And, and I understand the reason uh, for um, wanting a higher mass. Right, it's it's um, um, you know a street presence on on a busy vehicular street. Um, but you're absolutely right, and the reason why is the market. And it doesn't mean we wouldn't if the market's there and we can secure tenants and, and build a two story or three story building. It doesn't mean we wouldn't do that. But we wouldn't want to be required to do that, right? There's a difference there, and uh, to hamper that development, um, in which we believe the market isn't there right now, um, or in the foreseeable future for that amount of of retail. This, I mean, this this land has been sitting for a long time, as Alex had said. Um, we want to just have the we want to have a little bit of flexibility there, and we're not against designing a building. As we come back into the SIP process, that has a taller mass, uh, but we would really um, push back on the requirement um, and ask for you respectfully uh, remove that as a requirement of this GDP. So, so I, I, Alex could probably expand on that more. Joe, you your your claim though is is kind of that its location, this particular location, doesn't have the market, in your opinion. Not only in my opinion, but Alex, who's <laughs> he's a retail guy in Madison for decades, right? And, and they've owned this property, and uh, I think that it's been sitting vacant is testament to that. But Alex can expand on that. Did that answer your question, Alder Heck? Yes, but if if Alex is registered, could could he uh, continue? I don't know if he's registered. Yes, or... yes. Alex, Alex Weiss. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Alder, that's a great question. And as, as Joel mentioned, we're, we were, I'm a real estate developer. 
it's what I do for a living. I, I don't have any other jobs. I, I want to maximize the potential of the land that I own uh, from a financial standpoint, uh, to put it bluntly. And we've owned this land since 2005. Uh, and we haven't had much demand to speak of in terms of commercial tenants. And as Joe said, we're not opposed to building two stories or three stories or whatever. We'd love to do that if we can, if the demand is there. We just don't want to be required to do it uh, because, for example, what if a, a, a grocer came along, a small boutique grocer? Uh, not too many grocery stores have a second floor above them besides the Trader Joe's on Monroe that I can think of in this market. They're not going to do it in a suburban market. What if we had a hardware store, a little neighborhood hardware store that everybody would love? Not too many hardware stores have a second floor above them in a suburban market. So what we don't want to do is limit our ability to develop the land that we've owned for so long uh, with, with a two-story or multi-story requirement. As Joe said, we, we'd be agreeable to, uh, I don't know how it's written, but to, to having the building be taller and to, to show better street presence and massing. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's that's where we're coming from. If If we could... If we can build more stories and rent more space, we're all for it. But if uh, we don't want to be required to do that, so. Anything further, Alder Heck? I think that answered my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is also a question for Alex, and I really am following up a little bit on Alder Heck's question. Um, but it it feels a little bit to me like. Um, you want the you want approval for a minimal amount of development on the western portion of the site. Would there be an option to um, have no development on that site? Uh, is that is in other words are you, are you being does the process in some way almost require you to build some sort of commercial space there, even though you don't have a tenant for it? I, and, I, and I'm going to just say right off the bat, I'm. I'm not comfortable with that high degree of surface parking and a very low um, intensity of, of development there. Uh, I'm sensing that may not even be what you want to put there. And that's I'm kind of I'm kind of fishing that question a little bit. Is there is there some other way to preserve that land for some future more intense development? Alex? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I don't know if I got muted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another good question. So we philosophically would like as dense a use there as possible. Uh, we're, not, we're not asking to build what's shown on the, the commercial portion of the plan right now. We don't want to develop the whole, it's, as, as Tim mentioned, 3.82 acres is developable there in a, in a rectangle. Uh, we don't want to do it all with residential. We want to do what we showed as residential uh, mixed use with the 2,500 square feet of commercial. Uh, so we want flexibility on the 1.2 acre lot to the west to do commercial development there. We just don't know what that development is going to be yet. So would it remain as green space? Maybe for a while, uh, just like the uh, 3.82 acres has and green space since long before we owned it in 2005. So it's possible, but I, I wouldn't be interested in never developing that land. If that answers the question, I'm not sure. I, I think as well as, can be, as well as can be done, thank you. Yeah, I jumped around any, a little, thank you. Any further questions, Commissioner Fernandez? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder Wahili. Thank you, Chair. So similar question for Joe or Alex. Uh, I think we, first of all, I appreciate your patience and the staff who really worked on this. But the question that has been raised really has, you know, give me another perspective. And basically it is, is if the commercial situ economic situation is not favorable in that area, why allocate certain land or parcel for commercial use would the uh parcel be used all for presidential instead of just a site 
putting aside for commercial that we don't know could exist since there is no favorability in there? That's my first question. I have another question too. Alex? Uh, good question. I, I think that we're, we are primarily commercial developers. I'll start with that. In 2010, the GDP was uh, more or less neighborhood mixed use with a heavy emphasis on commercial and no residential on the 3.82 acres. Uh, so we wanted to maintain, I guess, part of this property to be a commercial designated development uh, for future demand. We, we don't have a uh, specific use in mind for it at this point, but we feel like developing 1.2 acres as commercial is a lot more viable than trying to develop the 3.82 acres all as commercial. So that's my response to the first question, Alder. Thank you. What's your next question? The next question is, I and I know maybe the commissioners might not be aware of this, there has been a communication with the uh, Ryan Funeral Home, and you know basically their uh, their intent was to have that area built in their uh, in in funeral home, and that's the the structure and the requirement they need is like a one story uh, building, and I'm wondering if that's one you know you, that's the intent in the future. Alex. Yes. Uh... We are continuing to talk to Ryan occasionally about the site, but they don't have uh, the property under contract. So I, I believe they're still interested. Um, I, I don't know how else to answer. Ryan Ryan is a fourth, four generation old Madison company that wants to put a location in this neighborhood somewhere. And we're talking to, with them about it, but nothing is nothing is final at this point. They would and have when, to, if, if we get GDP approval here, they would have to go through the SIP process, just like we, we're going to have to for the apartments. And just so everyone knows, our, our plan currently is to develop the apartments for long-term ownership for ourselves and possibly sell off the 1.2 acre lot to the West. And Ryan is one commercial user that we're talking with. And approving uh, the kind of uh, uh, GDP that if we remove the requirement for two-story uh, building, that can be able for them to go into that area, correct? Uh, I'm not sure if that's a question for me, but I, I think that the one to two-story question is, it's universal when it comes to commercial. Mo most of the, I've done a lot of retail development, restaurant development, uh, clinic, health clinic development over the last 25 years and very little of those type of uses have been multi-story. And as Joe and mentioned, we're just opposed to a, a requirement of two stories. I Ryan think the funeral. question was whether that would be suitable then for Ryan to go ahead and go in if it's one story. So it was specifically about Ryan. Okay. Well, I, I can't speak on Ryan's behalf, but I, I've never seen a two-story funeral home in this market. So- okay. Thank, thank you. you. Did you have any further questions, Alder? No, thank you. I have questions okay. for the staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to expand on this because, um, sorry, this would be for Joe or Alex. Um, I'm not sure. You mentioned that you would be willing to design to a larger volume. Um, to incorporate some of this feedback. So I just wanna read what it specifically says in the condition. The building design shall be more in line with the two-story plan recommendations, either by adding a story or by incorporating an architecture volume like a mezzanine, et cetera. So it is not necessarily a full second story. We've seen other buildings um, just recently completed with national chains that have you know, a mezzanine volume. So I guess I want clarity as, are you opposed to that specific language, even though it is not specific to a second story? Um, I, I can take that, Alex. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the answer would be yes, we would be opposed to that for the, for the use of the word mezzanine. Um, that is a very specific definition in building codes where that's an actual 
a level that gets built out above a ground floor level. So we would be we would be against that language, but again, not against the spirit of um, what is trying to be accomplished, which is a, a greater volume or a greater mass on the exterior um, design of the building, specifically at the corner. That makes sense. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Any further questions of any of our registrants? Alder Paulson. Yeah, I just want to talk about building heights on the residential side of it. Um, uh, the, in that in that district, you could go up to four stories. Um, I don't know what your you know, and I know it's way early to be talking unit mix uh, and and parking stall mixes and and such. But I was wondering, uh, is there a reason you didn't uh, at least keep open the option to go into four stories there, or just some additional? Uh, sure. Yeah. I can. Can can everybody still hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, yeah, it has it has a lot to do with what you just talked about. Oh, sorry about that. Um, as far as um, parking mix and unit counts and unit ratios and overall absorption, that kind of thing. So um, for this site, for this developer um, in the marketplace, um, this density um, is really um, what they want to uh, pursue. And you know the, the parking ratios we're showing are uh, market standards. Um, if if we go uh, more units, then we're going to be uh, if we go up, right? We're going to be short in our parking ratio, and then there's going to be problems. Um, so um, and and then again, there's there are absorption factors and in pro formas that uh, that our our clients like to use, and as far as uh, absorption rates and that kind of thing. So. It's it's really uh, it, it's a science as to as to what uh, gets proposed. Um, so that's that's resulted in um, the three story uh, development pattern on this site. Does that answer your question, Alder Paulson? Yeah, I guess. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, any further questions of any of our registrants? Seeing no raised hands, I'll close the public hearing. Is there are there questions of staff? Alder Wahili. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tim, I if you can walk us through again the uh, what's before us, the six and a half acres, the whole land, uh, but then we are approving 3.2. Is that just the apartments, the mixed use apartments, or that's also include the commercial? It, in, it includes all of the undeveloped land uh, extending from the corner of Maple Grove and McKee to the west and to the south, uh, bounded on the, the south by Mater and on the west by Golden Copper. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's coincidental that it also includes the stormwater ponds west of Golden Copper. Uh, that's not the, the primary focus of the amendment uh, or of the staff comments. Uh, it's the land. Uh, bounded by McKee, Maple Grove, Mater, and Golden Copper. Thank you. And the other question is, in uh, in your presentation, you alluded to the original PD uh, that was uh, the zoning that was approved a long time ago is quite different than what's uh, before us. Can you uh, explain the main differences? Well, there's there's two parts to, to every general development plan. Uh, there's additional parts, but for the purposes of answering this succinctly, we'll have the plan, uh, which shows uh, where buildings will be placed in their general mass, access, how they'll be parked, uh, but at a very high level. Uh, it's not uh, detailed architecture. It's not specific landscaping. Uh, it's just basically what we would like to put where and roughly how we're going to do it. That's the, the plan portion of your GDP. And then there is a zoning text, which is the, the way that that land will be governed in the future in terms of uh, allowed uses, uh, any bulk requirements in terms of uh, building heights, setbacks, parking uh, for autos and bicycles, uh, any specific conditions. Uh, that might be unique beyond what 
uh, would typically be required in Madison General Ordinances. So in this case, we have a 2010 site plan that shows uh, this site being developed with uh, one and two story, predominantly commercial buildings and surface parking. Uh, that was reviewed in 2010 uh, against the recommendations in the 2006 comprehensive plan. Uh, and at the time, the, the plan commission and the common council did approve uh, you know, a, a much lower scale project uh, than what uh, plans would call for now, uh, because I would say that the neighborhood mixed use uh, category in the 2018 comp plan is uh, perhaps a little more amplified uh, or seeks greater uh, development intensity than perhaps the 2006 comprehensive plan did. Uh, although that may be a, a matter of opinion. Uh, and then, uh, you know, but that that plan has essentially expired because it was not implemented within the 10 years that the zoning code requires. Um, there's a zoning text uh, that specified what uses would be allowed, uh, which uh, precluded uses, which, you know, since it's come up in the conversation tonight, funeral homes uh, or funeral parlors uh, were not an allowed use in that 2010 zoning text. So that is another reason uh, why uh, the, the GDP amendment is before you, uh, because the zoning text precluded some of the uses uh, that the uh, project team may want to bring forward here uh, tonight, not specifically a funeral home, but I will point out that the proposed list of uses in the zoning text that was included with the amended GDP that's before you uh, would, allow, uh, would allow funeral homes, the previous one would not. Uh, so you have uh, three reasons why this GDP is before the body tonight, uh, most notably because the 10 year uh, effective period of it has expired, but also because the site plan proposed is different than the site plan that was approved in 2010. And also the zoning text uh, proposes uh, perhaps a somewhat more expansive list of allowable uses for the site than what was previously approved in 2010. Thank you, Tim. Did you and, have any further questions, Alder? Yes, Chair. One more, one more question. Thank you. And and Tim, you know, when they expand that when they expanded the list of the possible use for the uh, for the site. Uh, Will it be amended if we remove uh, some of those and put into restriction, for example, like, you know, in 2020, if it excluded a uh, uh, funeral home, can we exclude a funeral home in this amendment? That would be uh, before the plan commission and the common council to consider. Uh, there is no, uh, specific right to uh, a proposed list of uses. Uh, so if it's decided that in reviewing a proposed plan development, in particular, the general development plan zoning text, if it's felt that a specific use or uses uh, would not be appropriate at that location, then uh, it would be uh, within the, the plan commission's purview to recommend uh, that that use or uses uh, either not be included at all, uh, or if it was proposed, uh, for example, as a permitted use, uh, that it it could be that that use was only allowed uh, as a conditional use. It's not terribly common that uh, conditional uses come before the plan commission uh, in plan development zoning districts. However, the zoning code does allow that. And so uh, that would put a specific use, uh, if it were approved at this stage as a conditional use, uh, that uh, when that use came forward in the future, that the conditional use standards would have to be applied uh, to that uh, use. Uh, in addition to, uh, say, if we're talking about new construction, uh, that uh, there would need to be a specific implementation plan approved. Uh, it, it, it would be possible that that SIP is before the plan commission and that there's a related item approving a conditional use uh, for the use of that space that is subject to the proposed SIP. Thank you, Thank Tim. You. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, uh, 
Thank you. I wanted to touch on this question of uh, two-story versus one-story versus massing that looks like two-story versus uh, one-story with a mezzanine. Um, to me, the requirement for two-story is not an architectural requirement to get a big look in building. It's it's to increase the intensity of development on the site. Now, if I'm if I'm wrong, I I want to be told that I'm wrong. But I'm I'm not particularly in favor of building a one-story development and throwing a Wild West style, style two-story facade in front of it to look like it's something bigger than it is. Is is this essentially a visual request re requirement, or is this requirement there because we want to see more intense development? Well, I would say that first and foremost, we would uh, recommend more development here, not less. Uh, you know, both the building volume and the site utilization, uh, you know, compared to a lot of other sites recommended for neighborhood mixed use, I think the expectation would be more building, more intensity, more density, more program, less parking. Uh, or parking that is in line with the intensity of development that's proposed. In this case, a one-story, maybe two-story, one-story, uh, up to 10,000 square foot commercial building uh, with a you know a pretty substantial parking field adjacent to it uh, is something that would be more consistent with general commercial in the comprehensive plan. Uh, less so with neighborhood mixed use. So uh, sort of the, the 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 middle road that we're we're proposing, uh, if the plan commission is amenable, is that uh, we have a 10,000 square foot building that is oriented to the adjacent streets, has active entrances, would be two stories. If it cannot be two stories, I would say that the proposed conditions allow. Uh, enough play where, uh, and I believe it was alluded in Commissioner Solheim's comments, uh, that uh, you'll see uh, additional height, additional volume, uh, maybe uh, a, a window patterning that suggests uh, more, not less, happening within uh, the walls and the roof uh, than what there may in fact be. Uh, whether there's a mezzanine or not, I think that that language, which was was borrowed from the Urban Design Commission's recommendation, is intended to suggest that perhaps a mezzanine would be a way to accomplish uh, not just some additional volume, but some additional program, because perhaps you would take some of the things that would occur in the one-story building and lift them up in a partial level, it's not a full story. It doesn't in, it, it doesn't span the entire footprint of the building, uh, but perhaps you take some of those back office things, or we've even seen uh, in some cases uh, storage elements of a building and have taken them off of the main floor, put them into an elevated space, and then seen that space treated architecturally to make it appear as though there is more there than in fact there may be. Any follow-ups, uh, Commissioner Fernandez? I think so. The only other, so, you know, I'm in com complete agreement, more program, less surface parking. Um, is it, I'm, I'm going back to the sense that the, the whole development feels not quite right to me to, to put the residential on the corner of Maple Grove and then put some fairly low intensity commercial uh, uh, to the west of it when there clearly isn't even a, a plan uh, on board for that space. Um, is there some other way to approach this? It, it almost sounds like the developer is not ready to touch that space but needs to needs to get something in place that doesn't commit him to a whole lot of investment at this point. Is there another path here that would allow that to remain undeveloped until, until the market is there for higher, uh, uh, higher use, higher intensity use? I, I don't want to contradict Mr. Weiss, who is, is very experienced in commercial development uh, across the region, 
uh, whether or not, you know, my opinions, whether or not there's a reason to develop now versus his reasons for now or later or this or that, uh, I would simply point out that uh, you have the question before you, the, the project team has be put before the plan commission an amended general development plan that shows what it shows, proposes what it proposes in terms of the, the square footage of building, the proposed volume, how they want to park it, roughly the sort of uses that they would want to uh, allow in there. Uh, we've heard suggestions that that could be a funeral home, but it may not be. And they're putting the, the project in, intentionally forward uh, as commercial, uh, which is a very open-ended uh, you know, classification. And so the question before the plan commission, I, you know, I, I would say that saying, no, you can't develop that portion of the site now, uh, you know, you would have to couch that in, you know, basically saying what's before you for that portion of the site to the plan commission's perspective does not meet neighborhood mixed use and we don't approve it. And that would be the way to characterize uh, the matter that's before the body tonight, uh, because, you know, like we even said in the staff report, we really encourage, I mean, there, I'm, I'm not going to quite say that the red carpet's going to be rolled out, but uh, if anything other than a one-story 10,000 square foot commercial building gets proposed for that site, we are going to be all ears wanting to talk about that and see that versus what's proposed. But the applicant has the right to put forward what they they believe they would like to see developed on the property that they own. They're a longtime owner of the property. Uh, they've made that very clear. And I've worked with them on this site uh, for most of the time that they've owned it. Uh, so I, I certainly, you know, can can second what they're saying there. I, I think the question just becomes, uh, is this you know, the right use of the site? Do you feel okay. that it reflects the, the plan recommendations? Uh, if yes, with conditions, what are those conditions? If not, why not? Okay, fair enough, Tim. Could you recap for me what the conditions are right now with regard to once? Well, how does it, does it say it shall be two-story? What, what, what does the condition say right now? Uh, let me, I'll just pull that up here. It might be easier for some of us to just, whoops, that's a dramatic zoom, uh, to, to just read the Urban Design Commission's recommendation is this one, the commercial building shall be designed to hold the corner and maximize the building volume at the corner of Golden Copper Lane and McKee Road. The building design shall be more in line, line with the two-story two story plan, plan recommendations, either by adding a story, so basically a two-story building, uh, or by incorporating an architecture volume like a mezzanine, et cetera. And just above, uh, staff is, is a, providing effectively uh, a second to the Urban Design Commission's recommendation. Uh, we, in this case, didn't really deviate very much. The, the condition that was different from staff compared to what came out of the Urban Design Commission uh, had to do with building orientation, active entrances in. Uh, recommended condition number two, but we have a condition uh, number three that in, intends to, to provide a little more shape to the Urban Design Commission recommended condition about that one story building. And again, that is talking about a, uh, a, either adding a second story uh, or adding an uh, architectural element uh, such as a mezzanine to create more volume there. Uh, than what you would typically get with a, a standard one-story commercial building. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the uh, subtlety with which you're working with this. Commissioner Mendez. Yeah, uh, Tim, so question. If, they came, if the developer came back with a funeral home, for example, as what they wanted to put there, um, would that be able to come to us as a conditional or conditional use, and then we can approve that for the one story based off of you know other UDC and other feedback, or is it has to be? I, I understand the volume, so I get that. So mm -hmm. there's still a way that they could potentially do the funeral home and still meet the intent of the UDC recommendation, correct? So uh, to answer that. 
the second step uh, for the folks watching at home uh, in any plan development after a general development plan approved is one or more specific implementation plans uh, would have to be approved. And that would go through the same process that the GDP goes through in terms of review by the Urban Design Commission and a recommendation to the Plan Commission. Uh, and then the plan commission making a recommendation to the common council on whether the specific implementation plan should be approved. One of the primary factors in the plan commission's recommendation on an SIP is whether it's consistent with the approved general development plan. And so we have an amended G GDP before the body tonight that uh, calls for a 10,000 square foot uh, footprint in that corner. Uh, a zoning text that would allow a funeral home as a permitted use because it's a permitted use in the CCT zoning district. And they're going to uh, basically use uh, the CCT district uh, by uh, uh, basically the, and it, you can, you can draw up your own zoning list uh, for a site, or you can point to a zoning district and say, we'll do what they're, we'll have what they're having. Uh, and you can do that uh, either as the uses that are permitted in that district, uh, uses that are permitted or conditional, and, and they're choosing the latter here. So an SIP comes forward for a funeral home, given the proposed zoning text, and it's in the location that it's shown. It's, it's roughly 10,000 square feet. The use is allowed in the proposed zoning text. They meet the design-related conditions However, they end up. I mean, we have proposed language from UDC and staff. Obviously, the Planning Commission, the Common Council can tweak that, amplify it, reduce it however they see uh, appropriate. But that box comes, uh, the use is allowed, it meets whatever the criteria are in the GDP approval for orientation, height, et cetera. The Planning Commission is primarily tasked with saying, yes, that is consistent with the GDP. Uh, you can't just, you know, suddenly apply a different lens or a brighter spotlight to it because it's a particular use. The time to really set that that forth is is now with the GDP, which would be to suggest that um, uses or or the plans or both somehow don't work, but they could work if we, you know, made adjustments uh, to to either the plans or the zoning text or both. Thank you, Tim. Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, Tim, I assume you'll answer this. I'm going to read you a possible amended condition of approval, and I'd like to hear if you have any issues with it, if that's all right. Um, this would be the second sentence in that condition of approval number three, the, the sentence we've been referencing. Uh, the building design shall be more in line with the two-story plan recommendations. Get rid of the, world, the word either and then say by adding a story, then get rid of or, comma, by incorporating an architecture volume like a mezzanine and then add or, massing that is similar to a two-story structure or some combination thereof gives them some gives more wiggle room is is my intent and knowing that uh, jla or whoever the architect might be uh that's designing this in the end uh could would would then have a choice of either combining those those approaches or uh or not and so i'm adding that the massing could be more like a two-story structure without referencing the mezzanine, although that would still be an option. I I think that that's completely fine. I, I think that in some respects, it might even get to what we're talking about a little more directly, which is to say our first choice is a two-story building, uh, you know, first floor, second floor, end of story. But if it isn't that you know, it's going to look like it, even if it's a one-story building. Uh, so I, I would say that that, in in my estimation, you know, being put on the spot uh, is is maybe trying to clarify the 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 condition, you know, to give some more flexibility that perhaps the project team doesn't feel exists in the current wording, uh, while also uh, reflecting the plan recommendations. Okay, thank you. That was my question. 
Uh, Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Very quick question on the other commercial space in the mixed use building. As I am reading it, I believe that there's discussion about how staff did not necessarily support the UDC recommendation of allowing all residential in that building. And that UDC recommendation is in the staff report. So if it was approved as is, that flexibility would remain. If we wanted to keep that residential building mixed use, we should specify that that condition is removed. Is that correct? Yes, thank you. That's a that's mm -hmm. a, a very good clarification and probably one that I should have touched on in the staff report. Well, in the recommendations, bearing in mind that the planning staff has a long and sometimes checkered history of trying to uh, not seem like we're contradicting the Urban Design Commission, whose input we so richly value, especially in conversations like this. Uh, at the same token, trying to express some disagreement, uh, kind of felt like that comment came a little bit uh, out of left field. Uh, but I mean, they made the comment, it's before the plan commission, and the plan commission can decide uh, how to, to include it or not include it in its recommendation. Alder, what's your name? Alder Wahili, did you? Yeah thank, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, one other question, and Tim, I'm sorry, you know, uh, my question is, was there a reason why in the past there was uh, the funeral home was removed from the, uh, the usage of this uh, area? And why is it now recommended to be expanded for the use in this uh, residence? muted myself. Uh, no, I don't recall uh, back to, you know, 2009, uh, 2010, why funeral home was not included. Uh, I will say that at that time, uh, we were preparing for what is now the current zoning text, which I know everybody, you know, celebrated on January 2nd, the 10th anniversary of the current zoning code. I know I certainly did, uh, but at the time uh, we were preparing for what is now the, the current code, uh, and there were there was a thought that some plan developments should maybe have their own enumerated list uh, versus referencing zoning districts that uh, even in 2010 we did not anticipate would be there in a couple of years, and so making a reference to the now long former C2 zoning district would really just create more work for staff because we would have to go back and that would be just another instance of, okay, what was the C2 district at the time that this was approved? And is that use allowed or not and under what conditions? And so there was a period of time where we were pushing folks to do enumerated use lists. And it's just possible that uh, it didn't make the cut in their enumerated list. Uh, and so that that's my recollection, but I'd have to go back uh, deeper into the archives uh, beyond that. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Um, are there any further questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, uh, I'm looking for a motion. Um, Alder Wahili, did you have another question? I would like to make a comment, if that's okay. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. So I I was involved in this project and I met with the uh, developers. Uh, we did have a community neighborhood and uh, they have been a lot of uh, um, uh, pushback uh, for uh, this area to have a funeral home. Uh, because of its proximity to residents and the way it's the um, the the PD as it is uh, described, it's not um, serving uh, neighborhood serving commercial use. That's consistent with the uh, the comprehensive plan. If funeral home is built in this area, so I will like to. Um, let the commissioner know, commissioners, 
to know that having uh, moving this project forward without the restriction of funeral home, I'm af afraid that it might be some uh, difficulties later on or some kind of uh, pushback from the neighborhood. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I am looking for a motion. Commissioner Solheim. Thank you. Um, I will move that the plan commission can find the standards for plan development met and forward the zoning map am uh, amendment approving an amended PD GDP for 6853 McKee Road uh, with a recommendation uh, to council of approval subject to the conditions in the staff report with two adjustments. Um, one, and under the uh, condition related to second story and mezzanine, I would like to adopt Alder Heck's alternative language, which perhaps we can review again. I hope someone was writing it down. And also to remove the Urban Design Commission uh, condition to provide the option to make building one all residential. Uh, do we have a second? Seconded by Alder Heck. Uh, Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? Um, I just wanted to add that I, I do think, I do hope we see something, two stories. I know it's somewhat dependent on tenant, but um, hopefully this adds enough uh, flexibility. I also really want to stress the condition. I think staff added some good language to um, the condition about reducing parking as much as possible because I, I believe, and I think other commissioners agree that there is way too much surface parking on the current proposed plan. Are there any other observations or comments? Alder Paulson. Yeah, I would just point out that um, this, the, the network redesign, like literally the two routes start right there, like literally right there at that exact spot. Like you can go from this spot to the airport almost directly. There's one little hook out of the way that swings you south for a couple of minutes. But other than that, it's uh, straight up the isthmus uh, swing, but wave by the Capitol and then you're off to the airport. Uh, and then the other bus loops you around just a little bit and heads right into downtown via UW, you know, the UW hospital. And and um, I realize it's not like the, the network isn't fixed route, right? You know, we're not making promises for 50 years, like digging tunnels you would with a subway. Uh, but, you know, this is going to be in place for 10 or 20 years, at least for, for good transit. And it just feels like we really, really, really want to maximize um, the usage of this. Gosh, I wish they could go six stories uh, on, on, on these residential buildings um, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's getting just a fantastic um, transit upgrades uh, for an area that doesn't have very good transit uh, right now. And it just, for the, the bullseye, it feels like we should not do anything that minimizes the, the, uh, the land use. And so I actually really would prefer that we keep the two-story commercial, you know, Okay, when we did all the TOD stuff and we had a debate about two-story gas stations, so well, maybe we should do two-story gas stations. I will admit that you know one thing that we did forget about is maybe we probably should have added an exception for funeral homes because maybe that's a little weird to, to have something above. Um, but there's so much commercial that you can find uh, and do two stories. You can put apartments above a two-story building and that will be just fine. I'm not worried about anyone, uh, but any commercial use that can't find something above it. Um, uh, so I'm fine with leaving these as uh, two stories. And if like, honest to goodness, you can't, you can come back and ask for a new uh, GDP. Um, you know, it's uh, 12 months or 12 weeks. Uh, it's not that hard to do if we had, if someone just honest to goodness has to do it. So I would really like to see us um, uh 
not adopt uh, Alder Hex language and leave in a uh, a two-story requirement for the commercial uh, here, because I think that's that's on the start towards making this a a more intensive use. Um, and, and I just don't think we should uh, compromise here because I think it's consistent with, with what we want and it's consistent with all the other plans that we're, uh, we're adopting for um, uh, making this a, an area that is just well served by transit uh, and it should be, uh, we should maximize the amount of people that we, in activity we can put here. So maybe Thanks. I'll make a motion in a little bit, but I'll see where folks come down. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, thank you. Well, I would just like to reinforce what Alder Paulson said. I, I agree with that. At this point, I would like to see greater intensity on the site. It, I may be wrong, but it does not feel like a huge burden to require two stories, and then the development simply waits until until that's viable. The alternative of uh, building volume, heating it, and not having program in it really really sits wrong with me. Uh, you know, we, we've now created a facade and, and a greater expenses um, and use of uh, fuels, et cetera, and we have not done what we're trying to do, which is, you know, so just the, the appearance of a larger building does not feel like it satisfies uh, our real intent here. So I'm agreeing with uh, Alder Paulson on this. I would rather require a two-story building. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Alder Paulson. I will make a motion to amend uh, uh, Commissioner Saltheim's uh, motion uh, and remove Alder Hex, fantastic, but not quite repeatable off the top of my head uh, language uh, and leave the original staff, uh, leave the original recommendation for uh, either two stories or some kind of additional programming for mezzanine. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Up. Uh, is there a second to Alder Paulson's motion? Uh, seconded by Commissioner Fernandez. Alder Paulson, did you want to speak further to your uh, motion? No, I think I've covered it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Fernandez, did you want to comment on it at all? I would have gone further to actually require two stories, but I'm I'm satisfied with that this is moving in that direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Shepard. Uh, yeah, can we have Alder Heck just repeat his um, the amendment, what he uh, talked about, just for clarity's sake? Uh, Alder Heck, could you please read your language? I could. Um, I have to go back to the original language. Okay. The second sentence would, would be, the building design shall be more in line with the two-story plan recommendations by adding a story, by incorporating an architecture volume like a mezzanine, comma, et cetera, or massing that is similar to a two-story structure or some combination thereof. Thank you, Alder Heck. Uh, Commissioner Solheim. Um, can I ask a question of staff at this point to clarify? Sure, um, go ahead, yes. And if the motion is to go back to the original language, I am reading the original language to not require a second story, although I believe that was perhaps Alder Paulson's intent with the discussion. So I just wanna clarify, I. It feels like the original language does have some flexibility. We were clarifying that flexibility a bit more with Alder Hex language. I, I just want to be clear as to what we're getting at here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Tim. Let's let's see the minds of the Urban Design Commission who is not present. My understanding is that the Urban Design Commission uh, was looking for uh more more volume 
and suggesting the mezzanine as a way to accomplish it. Uh, to be honest, I, I would have to refer to the uh, draft urban design commission report that I don't have, let's see, can I get that pulled up here? Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. We are going to be looking for this commercial building to really hold the corner when we see this at the SIP level, maybe a mezzanine or high retail story to give it some presence. Uh, that's one of the UDC mm -hmm. member comments on page two of the report. Mm -hmm. uh, do, 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 concurrent, give it an update of commercial. It seems like there was more discussion about not doing commercial in the A buildings than there was uh, what to do with the height of the commercial building. But that that would seem to be the you know, the, the comment, the influence coming out of Urban Design Commission uh, was to, uh, to hold the corner and, uh, you know, maybe a mezzanine or high retail story to give it some presence. Uh, but that manifests itself uh, as maximize the building volume at the corner of Golden Copper and McKee. Uh, the building design shall be more in line with the two-story plan recommendations, either by adding a story or by incorporating an architectural volume like mezzanine. And this is this is probably a good time to point out that the uh, Urban Design Commission uh, has not approved those minutes yet and won't do so until February 1st. Uh, so this is staff's interpretation of what they heard at the meeting on January 11th. And uh, that's reflected in the draft UDC report as parroted in uh, my staff report uh, for what that's worth. Um, so maybe we need to make sure uh, from Alder Paulson if what his intent was, um, were you intending something clearer than what we're getting from uh, the UDC um, language. Uh, I made my motion to not necessarily require a second story. Uh, okay. To say that there was um, the option to to have some additional programming, I would be very happy if the commission voted mine down to to go for a second story amendment to make it even more intense. But I thought, kind of where we were at with the UDC might be a a a a fine start. Okay. Okay. So we uh, have the um, amendment to uh, vote on. If there is no more discussion, I don't see any raised hands, then we will come to a vote. And I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Okay. I see three hands. Four hands objecting. Um, we still have then five votes in favor, if I'm counting correctly. Heather, help me here, um, which would mean that uh, the motion would pass, I believe. I believe the chair would have to break a 4 4 tie. Okay. Then um, I do not want to vote in favor of the motion. So the motion fails. Do we have another motion? Uh, I mean, we can go to the main motion or is there any other um, amendment that anyone wishes to offer. Alder Paulson. Because I said, I hope the, the commission votes against it. Um, uh, so I will offer a, a cleaner motion, uh, which is to simply require a two-story commercial building. Uh, okay. Is there a second? Space. Is there a second? Seconded by Commissioner Fernandez. Did you wish to speak to your motion, Alder Paulson? 
Uh, no, I think we'll just, I think we kind of all understand what we're voting on here and we will see where we come down on this one. So, okay, great. Thank you. Um, then we will, is there anybody else who wants to comment on this? Then we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Uh, we have um, four raised hands objecting. So I will have to vote again and I vote in favor of the amendment. So that passes. Now we will be voting on the main motion as amended. Anyone have any comments on this motion? Seeing none, we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes. That took a little longer than what I anticipated. Um, agenda item 22, Legistar 75242, um, located at 2335 City View Drive, 17th Alder District, consideration of a conditional use in the suburban employment district for a hospital to allow construction of an addition to and conversion of a two-story office building into a hospital. And I believe Heather's going to give us a summary of this, Heather? Sure, I'll, I'll keep it really brief. Again, before you is simply a conditional use in the suburban employment district for a hospital. Um, uniquely, this is an addition to an existing building, which we don't see too often, uh, particularly at this scale. So I think that's just worth noting. Um, staff does recommend approval, finding that the con conditional use standards uh, can be met with the proposal. I um, want to note that the conference of plan here actually recommends medium residential, but the more recent amended Nelson neighborhood development plan recommends employment. And so that um, basically creates the path that this is consistent with plans. Um, we do have a couple of recommended conditions uh, unique to the proposal. One is additional buffering uh, between the, the new hospital and residential buildings across Quarry Park Drive, and that would be in the form of evergreen plantings. Um, another uh, condition uh, was really based on a lot of conversations with Metro Transit, who noted that they don't have strong transit service in this area to serve the hospital. And I want to note that the applicant team uh, has submitted a transportation demand management plan that includes a, a commitment to serve, uh, you know, folks coming to the facility, as well as employees and even visitors with uh, van service uh, as, as needed. Um, and a variety of other uh, other elements in that trans transportation demand management plan, which the applicant may go into more detail on, but that did satisfy uh, Metro's concerns as referenced in the conditions of approval. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to uh, the registrants. Okay, thank you, thank you Heather. Uh, I will open the public hearing. The first registrant is uh, Jeffrey Woods, Tower Circle, Franklin, Tennessee, in support wishing to speak. And he said he's not representing an organization. I think he's the developer. But if you could clarify, Jeffrey, you have three minutes. Oh, I think you want the development team wanted to pool. So there will be nine minutes total for the development team. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, very good. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners and Alders. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Woods, and I'm an Operations Group President with Acadia Healthcare. Acadia is the applicant um, for this conditional use petition. Um, and just by way of a brief description, Acadia Healthcare is the largest provider, uh, freestanding, standalone provider of mental health and substance abuse services in the United States with approximately 241 treatment centers and hospitals across 43 states and Puerto Rico. We treat on average in excess of 70,000 patients each and every day across our continuum of care. And we are proud of the work that we do today within the broader Wisconsin market and the ability to bring healthcare that is healing closer to home. 
Um, we look forward to contributing to the health, welfare, and the orderly, orderly development of health care for the community. And in a moment, you'll hear from our design and construction team with Stengel Hill Architecture, who will share more, more details about the design elements of the hospital um, and the impact of this project uh, for the community. Um, I would also like to thank the planning staff who have been absolutely amazing and enormously helpful and collaborative throughout this process. And just to share a little bit about sort of how we view the vision of this hospital is to be a healing place with significant emphasis on the dignity of the individual, the care of the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. Our designs are intended to be safe, secure, and built to allow for abundant natural light, open spaces, high ceilings, all those things that drive dignity for the individual, that receiving care for mental health should not be a, 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 an occurrence in one's life that is stigmatized. And so we look in our, our design and our programs and in our services to lift up those individuals and their families as they return back to their communities and regain their lives. With that, I will pause and return the time so that the design team has an opportunity. Okay, the uh, next registrant is Todd uh, Waringa. Uh, West Main Street, Louisville, Tennessee, in support wishing to speak, representing Acadia Healthcare. Todd, uh, you are on. Can't hear him. Um, technical facilitator, is Todd unmuted? I think I briefly heard him for like a second. Okay. How's that? Can you guys hear me yes, now? Yes, now we can All hear right. you. Sorry, I didn't touch a thing, but um, okay. Um, so again, good evening and thank you for uh, your time. My name is Todd Waringa and I'm with Stingle Hill Architecture. The proposed project that you're looking at here at the renderings is a conversion of the existing two-story American Family Insurance office building be converting that to a new behavioral health hospital. That scope will require the conversion of the existing 50,000 square foot office building to a new 120 bed inpatient tower. And then we'll be constructing a 33,300 square foot single story addition um, out in the existing parking lot. Um, that addition will provide the necessary support space, such as administration, admissions, kitchen and dining, activity therapy, some outpatient services, and the engineering and maintenance uh, support to, uh, you know, provide services within this facility. There's two existing entrances to the site. One's from City View Drive and the second's from Quarry Park Drive. Uh, these will re remain unchanged. Um, the addition, as I mentioned before, will be added into the existing parking lot and we'll have a 146 total parking spaces and 42 bike parking spaces at the completion of the project. Um, in the renderings here, you can see the exterior materials that we're proposing for the project. Those include precast concrete, which is the existing uh, office building. Um, and then here in the rendering, uh, the addition, which you can see in the foreground, that's uh, a combination of modular stone masonry, ephus, uh, window glazing, and a metal panel and coping. Um, it's our intent to complement the existing office building while creating a new contemporary structure to fit within the existing uh, buildings within this area. If you can move to the next slide. You can see that we've got uh, it's a little closer view of the uh, project. You can better see the combination of the materials here. But um, my intent here is to show you that we've got the dark bronze window system, which matches the building in the background there. Um, excuse me. Um, and then this will also be bird safe glass, which we know is a uh, part of your zoning comments and, and uh, requirements. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see the uh, masonry and EFIS colors. Those have been selected um, to, again, match the precast of the building. The precast building is off to the right there. There's a small little um, staff area out to the side, which we plan to maintain. 
Um, and then further to the left, you can see the building addition. There's a stair and elevator tower there in the center. Um, the next two slides are just some closer views of the building and the landscaping. Uh, as has been said before, um, this project is already uh, an existing uh, building in operation. Uh, it's, well, it's been vacant, I should say, uh, for a short period of time, but the landscaping is very well done. We'll be supplementing that um, with our uh, new project here. Um, and then the last slide here, um, referring back to Heather's comments concerning the staff report and the buffering. Um, the A, B, and C that you see here in the plan, those are some views which correlate um, off to the right there in our slide. Um, the intent is so that you can see kind of as you present to the site from City View Drive, which is there at the top of the street, or excuse me, top of the slide, you turn to the right here on the Corey Park Road um, and proceed up the lane. The intent of the, the images here is just to show you that we're trying to buffer off of the front there. There were some concerns um, about ambulance traffic and entrances to the site. Um, Prior to understanding that the, the evergreen planting was uh, the requested buffer, we had um, rendered this with uh, deciduous trees, but uh, we'll go back and get that adjusted at a later time. Um, and with that, I'll return time back to the group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next registrant is Julie Musial, West Main Street, Louisville, Kentucky, in support wishing to speak representing Acadia Healthcare. Uh, Julie, you have the remainder of the nine minutes. I don't know if you can still hear there we me. Go. Okay, okay, Julie. There we go. Hi, good evening there. Um, Todd and I have pooled our minutes um, as part of the design team presentation. So um, the remainder of the time, we're just gonna turn back to, um, to discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The next registrant is um, Patrick Carroll, Cardinal Lane, either support nor opposed and wishing to speak. Uh, Patrick, you have three minutes. Uh, representing High Crossing, sorry, um, Hillside LLC. Go ahead, Patrick. Patrick, it looks like you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Jesse, can you help him? Patrick, you should uh, you should be receiving it. Here you go. I think you got it now. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, you have three minutes, Patrick, okay. please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I do represent IA High Crossing and IA Hilltop LLC. Uh, together, these entities own 12 commercial buildings and approximately 40 acres for future development uh, on the adja adjacent to this site in the High Crossing Office Park. Um, you know, we, we registered neither for nor against this project simply because we had not had an opportunity to understand the operators uh, and understand their operations. I think our biggest concern is the speed and procedure with which the conditional use hearing has occurred. Um, we were familiar with the project but did not give formal notice until Thursday of last week. Uh, we did not get a chance to speak to our alder regarding this project until this morning. Um, there's been no neighborhood meeting and no public forum to meet the operator and simply ask questions about how this facility would be run. Um, we, we could very well be for this project, but just don't feel like we've had the opportunity to have the conversations and understand um, exactly how this how this operation will be run. You know, a number of, of our questions that we have relate to safety protocols, not only for the neighborhood, but also for the patients. Um, you know, Acadia, this is not Acadia's first facility, so I anticipate that they have standard safety plans and procedures, but the community should simply be able to see those and understand them uh, prior to an approval tonight. Um, you know, with the patients, this location 
uh, I understand does not have emergency services. Uh, and so if there are emergencies, people would need to be transported to a more comprehensive facility um, and simply uh, not sure how close the immediate facility would be. Um, is this necessarily the best use? The, again, the answer could be yes. Well, we were a bit surprised that there was not a traffic impact analysis done uh, for a hospital. Uh, we did have a chance to briefly review their demand analysis for traffic. It does note how many inpatient clients they anticipate, but does not man mention potential daily traffic of outpatients. Um, and then we did ask about uh, ambulances, and I understand that there's been some adjustments to the site plan, but how would ambulances impact the greater neighborhood? Um, how many emergency ambulances are there versus non-emergent? Uh, where will emergencies be directed to, understanding that there's a rail crossing to the south? Um, and so I guess our point is that um, we would appreciate the opportunity to ask these questions prior to um, this hearing today for conditional use approval, understanding that this is really the only opportunity um, to raise these concerns thus far. Does that conclude your testimony, Patrick? Yeah, I think the only other thing I, I would add um, is, um, and Heather acknowledged the fact that this is currently at the zoning. Um, our group had worked both with the community and the alder on the Nelson neighborhood plan. Uh, we own a, the 25 acres to the south, which show as a potential for housing mix four in the neighborhood plan. Um, we, uh, again, had worked with the community, uh, would like to see something to that effect to the south. We have had initial discussions with the city about 200 apartment units across the street. Um, I raise these issues only to say that, you know, within five years, this neighborhood could look substantially different. Just want to make sure that, that uh, everybody understands, you know, what we are planning and thinking about in the future. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next registrant is Angie Black, uh, West Washington, Madison, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing Acadia Healthcare. Um, the next registrant is Tammy Russell, Tower Circle, Franklin, Tennessee, uh, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions. Wesley Wilkerson, Jefferson Highway, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing Acadia Healthcare. Uh, Bradley Lipsy, uh, Crossroads Boulevard, Brentwood, Tennessee, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing Acadia Healthcare. And finally, Christian Dalton, Crossroads Boulevard, Brentwood, Tennessee, in support, not wishing to speak, but available to answer questions, representing Crunk Engineering uh, in Brentwood, Tennessee. Are there questions of any of our registrants? Alder Heck. Thank you. I, I'm not sure who will want to answer this from the development team. Um, can you uh, talk about any attempts to engage the neighbors and or the alder? Um, let's try as the first registrant, Jeffrey Woods, and he can direct us to other members of the development team as necessary. Uh, Dr. Woods. Yes, thank you. Had to unmute there. <clears throat> you can hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I appreciate the, the question, um, Commissioner. And we did reach out to the neighborhood associations. We've also had conversations with um, uh, Alder Madison's office and Alder Madison directly. And um, we are planning an event I believe on February 10th um, with the neighborhood community. And, and with all due respect to Mr. Carroll, Patrick Carroll, who spoke earlier, um, he was actually part of a conversation with our design team on November 28th of 2022 with respect to this project. 
Um, I'm happy to address other of his concerns or comments or questions that he, he raised, um, but I did want to, to affirm that we have reached out to the community and we will continue to reach out to the community. And we want that input from the community, not, notwithstanding this process for the conditional use, we're going to reach out independently in order to get feedback and help provide um, additional refinements to the project to better meet the needs of the community. Okay, thank you. Thanks, that was my question for now. Okay, uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two questions. First, a very simple, direct one. Dr. Woods, is this a secure facility? Yes, am, am I still on? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, this is a secure facility, and I'll just sort of preface it in a couple of ways. The patients that we treat are individuals who have depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, um, thoughts and ideas of suicide from time to time. Those are the folks that are our neighbors. These are the folks that we all know. So I wanna make sure that we understand this is not a forensic facility. This is not a facility for criminally insane. This is for people in our own neighborhood, our own community, our own families who are suffering with substance use disorder, or mood disorder and thought disorders, standard psychiatric sort of disorders that require um, short-term treatment. The average length of hospitalization is around seven to eight days, and then the patient returns back home to their family or wherever it is that they came from to resume their life. The hospital is a secure facility, so all doors are secured. There are concentric rings of security that run through the building so that a patient cannot move from one section of the building to another. Um, or to exit the building without having been cleared through a, 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 these concentric rings of security. Likewise, nobody can enter the building without having the appropriate credentials and the appropriate electronic passes that allow them to enter. These are wristbands that the staff wear that allow them to be able to access the electronic uh, security system. There are a number of other security protocols in place for the facility that include staff training, um, independent security officers, depending upon what we deem as appropriate for the facility. Um, and so very, very high degree of security, but in an environment that is very warm, that is very receiving for folks and would love the opportunity for y'all to come out and see the facility when it's, when it's completed. And I think you'll be very impressed, not just with the security, but with the dignity that we bring to the patients. Uh, did you have any further questions, Commissioner? Just brief, yeah, thank you, Dr. Woods. Does that security uh, extend in any way to the site? In other words, is there anticipation of fencing or uh, monitoring cameras, any, anything that might be more um, troublesome for the neighborhood visually? Sure, sure. So thank you, Alderman. We, or excuse me, uh, uh, Commissioner, we, we will have security officers um, during hours of darkness who will be um, uh, on property and doing rounds on the property, both vehicular as well as on foot, uh, to ensure that the grounds remain safe. Not because we're concerned about patients exiting the hospital as much as we are about the integrity of the hospital itself, um, but there will be security. We do have cameras both inside and outside of the hospital. Um, it is not uncommon. In fact, it's quite common in our conversations with our, with our neighbors to set up a, an emergency alert system so that if there were some event in the hospital that um, could potentially impact the community, and generally that would be if there was a, you know, some, some sort of an accident that occurred in the hospital, a, a serious water leak or something else, that we'd be able to notify the neighbors of a change of condition for the hospital. Um, so there's lots of ways in which we can collaborate back with the community. Right. Okay, thank you. There visually, so visually, there's not going to be a uh, you know a three strand barbed wire around the oh, entire goodness perimeter. No. Goodness okay. no. None of our hospitals. Have that. I, I assume not, but I wanted to just clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, and I would also just comment then, Commissioner, that um, I, you probably couldn't see it in the design. It may be in your packet, but there are two internal courtyards for patients to be able to go out and get some fresh air and exercise and have covered space and walking paths but they are contained within the building itself. So there's no way for them to exit um, the, the property until they are released by their medical staff. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, I would be looking for a motion, please. Oh no, we, uh, I'll close the public hearing and go to questions of staff, sorry. Are there any questions of staff? Commissioner Fernandez. 
Well, I guess I have to ask this on behalf of Mr. Carroll. Um, does staff feel that the public information in this has been adequate? And if there's any chance that it's not, what would be the downside to um, continuing this to, for two weeks? Heather? Sure, I can take that. Um, and I wanted to mention, I, I had a note from Alder Madison who was unable to stay for the duration of this meeting. Um, I'm aware from conversations earlier today that Alder Madison is working with the applicant to get a meeting scheduled for early February. I think February 10th was the correct date um, that would function as a neighborhood informational meeting to talk about timeline and what to expect. Um, and the Alder is comfortable with this moving forward um, after her, her conversations with staff and with the development team today. I think that um, my understanding and I would need to defer to the development team, is that um, there is a need for, from their standpoint, for the plan commission to act this evening. Uh, they are running up against the end of their contract to purchase the property um, and have a sense of urgency in that respect. Um, I was assured by uh, the development team members that they did reach out on multiple occasions to folks in the, in the area um, and to the Alder to try to work on scheduling uh, a community meeting at an earlier date and did not have the interest at that time. So I think they've done the best that they could to uh, to try, you know, in the past several weeks to, to get something going and are more than willing to, uh, you know, to go ahead and meet with folks after this plan commission meeting to get to know neighbors and make sure that folks get their questions answered. Thank you, Heather. Did you have any further questions, Commissioner Fernandez? No, I, you know, I'm pretty concerned about a major neighbor feeling that they, for whatever reason, that they don't know much about this project. Um, um, but I can't assign, you know, it sounds to me like staff and developers saying, well, that, that opportunity has been there. Um, I wouldn't want to make an amendment to this effect, but I would certainly encourage the developer to continue that dialogue uh, and make sure that there's as smooth a transition here as possible. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions of staff? Okay, now I would be looking for a motion, please. Commissioner Solheim. I will move that the planning division, the plan commission finds the approval standards for conditional uses are met and approve the conditional use for a hospital in the SE district at 2335 City View Drive, subject to the conditions in the staff report. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Alder Paulson. Uh, Commissioner Solheim, did you wish to speak to your motion? No, thank you. Okay. Um, any comments, uh, input? Seeing no raised hands, we, oh, Alder Paulson. I was just gonna say, I, I'm happy to be able to support uh, something wholeheartedly with, all, with Commissioner Solheim. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, seeing no other raised hands, we'll come to a vote and I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, agenda item 25, Legistar 74357, located at 3180 Burke Road, Town of Burke. Approval of a certified survey map within the city's extraterritorial jurisdiction to create three lots. And uh, Tim Parks will give us an overview of this. Tim? Yes, thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Uh, just briefly, item 25 involves the division of an approximately 19 acre parcel located on the north side of Burke Road, roughly halfway between uh, Bailey Road and Thorson Road into the three lots that you see on screen. Uh, the proposed lots are 50,400 square feet in area or about 1.15 acres each. Uh, and it is a request by uh, the Jensen family 
uh, to create two additional residential lots uh, from the parcel, uh, a home uh, located in the, uh, we'll say along the Western portion of the Burke Road frontage uh, will remain on proposed lot one, uh, which is otherwise residential in character. Uh, the planning division has reviewed the request and we do not feel that it meets the standards and criteria for extraterritorial approval. As noted in the uh, staff report, uh, the project uh, is going to create a development pattern in our opinion uh, that is different than the land use or development pattern uh, that exists. Uh, on the north side of Burke Road, uh, there is uh, a town subdivision located across Burke Road from the site. Uh, however, uh, that was platted in 2000 uh, and there are no similar developments like it. Uh, you know, otherwise uh, on this section of Burke Road and in particular not on this section uh, on the north side of Burke Road. Uh, staff feels that uh, in addition to the creation of the development pattern, we're concerned uh, that the proposed land division uh, could adversely impact uh, impact uh, the ability for lands uh, to be annexed or attached uh, into the city sooner uh, than when this area is already scheduled to come into the city uh, pursuant to the uh, Burke Cooperative Plan, uh, in which case uh, the town of Burke will cease to exist uh, in October 2036 and the remaining portions of the town of Burke will be attached to uh, either the city of Madison, city of Sun Prairie, or village of DeForest. Um, until that time, uh, we would be concerned that this land division would impact any intermediate attachments that might occur, uh, and also that the uh, lots created would potentially impact the ability to install public improvements. Uh, because uh, now that the property would be divided, uh, there would have to be uh, coordination with uh, the, the property owners of the resulting lots. Uh, there's also, uh, lastly, a concern uh, about uh, the ability to develop the remaining larger, roughly 16 acre lot uh, following the land division, uh, as noted in the report. Uh, this is in the Reiner Neighborhood Development Plan area. Uh, which has uh, been uh, a planning effort that the planning division has been working on uh, for over two years, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, we feel that uh, while that plan has not yet been adopted, that uh, the development pattern that we're anticipating that that plan will recommend uh, would be uh, potentially impacted by uh, the proposed uh, land division that's before you tonight. So for those reasons, uh, we feel that uh, the land division should not be approved. Uh, however, there are conditions of approval recommended should the plan commission feel that the standards and criteria for extraterritorial approvals can be met. And I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, following the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I will open the public hearing. We do have one registrant, uh, Stacy Jensen, Leopold Way, Sun Prairie, in support and wishing to speak. Stacy, uh, you have three minutes. Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee for your time this evening. At this time, my family and I are requesting the division of my family's land to be divided into three separate residential lots. As our application letter of intent explains, this is my fam mother's request to continue a dream that was established by my grandfather over eight decades ago. It would also allow me and my family to remain close in proximity to care for my parents as they age and to have my family live on this property for decades to come. With that being said, I understand there are concerns about granting this request as summarized in the staff report. With no finalized plans proposed by the city of Madison for the Reiner road neighborhood development, my family and I have worked with Baron Cot surveying to create a compromise survey plan that meets the needs of both my family and the future development of the city of Madison. In addition, we have already obtained approval of the town of Burke and Dane County. First, during our initial survey drafts of the CSM, lots two and three were planned to be right next to each other to allow my family members to walk between the lots. However, to allow for the future development for the city of Madison, 
we created a revised CSM to allow for the continuation of Nature Drive between lots two and three. The continuation of Nature Drive would allow for direct access to the future Reiner Road neighborhood de development plan. Secondly, the space between lots two and three was intentionally designed to be a width of 60 feet, 66 feet. This 66 foot space provides the opportunity for future development of the Reiner Road neighborhood plan. Most importantly, this space allows lots two and three allow enough space for the expansion of city services. Contrary to the staff report, I do believe that this plan does support and does not prevent expansion of city services to the future Reiner Road development plan. Third, these lots were intentionally designed to match lot sizes in the neighborhood development, such as the Burke Conservatory Estates located across the street. Similarly to recommendations out, outlined in the staff report, the decision was made to ensure that the pro proposed lots fit into the current and future surrounding community and to maximize the size of the remaining lot one, which is mostly agricultural and currently farmed by a local farmer. To conclude, this proposal was designed to meet both the needs of my family and the future development of the city of Madison. So as you contemplate this decision, I urge you to consider our proposed CSM, which would allow my family to continue to reside on this land for decades to come and would allow and support the expansion of future development of the city of Madison. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Stacy. Um, are there any questions uh, of Stacy by any of uh, the commissioners? Commissioner Shepard. Hi, Stacy. I'm just curious if you uh, had a chance to look at uh, the staff report and on page five, um, where staff lays out a possible path to approval, where he talks about establishing a 66 foot wide, once again, reservation and that sort. Um, have you had a chance to look at that? And uh, do you have any comments on that? I believe, um, yes. So you're talking about the recommended condition of approval of the 66 uh, foot space between lots and two and three um, mm -hmm. to allow the uh, future space of Nature Drive. Yes. Right. In fact, the CSM that we approved from um, with Dane County actually does actually state future right of way of Nature Drive. I when I saw the one that was submitted to the city of Madison, I was actually surprised that it didn't state that. Um, but the one I actually have in my hand actually states future right away drive, right away for Nature Drive. So we would support submitting an uh, amended survey map with that in there. And my mother's um, said she would obviously support that. Okay. Uh, so just to be clear, do you have material that's not like in the public file then that should be submitted? Is that uh, what you're saying? If that I'm I'm saying when I when I opened up the materials that my surveyor submitted to Madison, I thought that it actually said future right away of Nature Drive, and I saw that it doesn't. But I know that that's okay. what Dane County had, and that's what the town of Burke had on their CSM one because I had to amend it to make that right away because they wouldn't approve it unless it said unless it did. So I was surprised when I opened up this material and it didn't say that. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jensen. Just kind of a follow-up question on that. So would, were that 66 feet to be come future right of way of a road, um, the city would also want uh, acceptable setbacks from the road for the buildings. Are those incorporated into the CSM also, or would you be willing to incorporate into the CSM appropriate setbacks such that if that did become a public road, uh, no buildings would lie within that setback zone? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? I guess we'd have to work with our survey. He would tell us what those requirements are because I don't have that information, but I'm assuming my, my surveyor would tell me that. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Any further questions of Stacy? Seeing no raised hands, I'll close the public hearing. Questions of staff?
Commissioner Fernandez. Yeah, so similar question. Um, I, I guess I want a little bit more of a description of why this is undesirable from develop, does it, from future development standards. Is it primarily the lack of a reservation of that 66 foot and appropriate setbacks or are there other um, very significant problems with this division? Kind of to distill our general perspective on land divisions in our extraterritorial jurisdiction, uh, it has long been our practice to, uh, you know, encourage larger parcels and not smaller parcels uh, and to really, you know, emphasize whether uh, we feel that a land division is continuing a development pattern versus creating one. Uh, the, the reason for that, uh, not to oversimplify, is that when you divide property, you create different constituencies uh, that have different interests, uh, may not be amenable to urban development, which is what the city of Madison will eventually be looking for out here. I can't say exactly when, uh, but you know the, the, the history going back decades is you know reviewing extraterritorial land divisions, very similar to this one, for the impact that they could have when the city gets there in areas where the city has been now for 20 to 30 years uh, we were we were guarding against uh, using our extraterritorial reviews uh, going back into the 70s and so it's it's a long game uh, and it's really intended to make sure that when we have uh, land divisions that they're as complementary as possible to our long-term vision. Uh, and that would be that eventually we're gonna grow into that area, uh, that the, the, the larger or the more whole that parcels are, uh, the more amenable they are to urban development. Uh, when you start adding uh, small lots uh, and lots with uh, residents on them, uh, they may they be averse to, uh, you know, the, the urban development that the plans will call for. And I, we, we will adopt the Reiner Neighborhood Development Plan uh, soon enough, although admittedly not as soon as I think uh, we would have liked. Uh, and we'll be thinking about the, the potential for that development once utilities can reach that site, which again, like the, the staff report acknowledges, uh, is in uh, the, 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 the relatively far off future. I mean, it's indeterminate. We don't have a schedule. We can't say, you know, five or 10 years from now, we're going to have water and sewer here and we're going to be ready for urban development because we're not. Uh, we're definitely looking beyond that. Uh, but when you have, you know, small lots uh, that are not the urban lots that we're looking for, you have to fit the urban development around them. Uh, you have buildings potentially put where water and sewer lines want to go, uh, particularly sewer uh, relies on gravity, uh, and that goes into the low spots. Now, that may not may not be specifically a concern here. I don't think that topography would be a major factor in sewer in the case of this specific 19 acres owned by the Jensen family, but we're talking about how we apply these criteria across the board. Uh, and we don't have a neighborhood development plan that's adopted here that would provide a, perhaps a little more guidance. And so that's you know even still a factor uh, while the neighborhood development plan is not directly a factor, you know, if we had a neighborhood development plan, we'd have more information to go on than if we didn't. Uh, so again, it's really, you know, criteria intended to, you know, preserve the long game, uh, anticipating uh, where we will grow in the coming decades. Uh, in fact, the Urban, I'm sorry, Urban Design Commission, we just talked about them enough already. Uh, the Plan Commission uh, last October uh, reviewed an amendment to our extraterritorial jurisdiction map, uh, which was effectively a reaffirming or a confirmation of where the city uh, anticipates growing. Because generally speaking, 
if it's going to be in our extraterritorial jurisdiction, that is an area where we're saying today, we're preserving our options for tomorrow. And so this area is in it, this area uh, along Burke Road, uh, west of the town of Sun Prairie Line, will come into the city in 2036 because we have a cooperative plan that says so. Once you go immediately east of this property and in into the town of Sun Prairie, where we do not currently have an agreement or a cooperative plan, we don't have as much certainty. But here we have certainty. We have a cooperative plan that allows us to review the development of the property in the time while it remains in the town. Uh, and we have our extraterritorial criteria that that say, you know, is it consistent with the development pattern versus creating one? And what impact will this land division have on future? It says annexations because it was drafted in the time before attachments as called for in cooperative plans, but attachments and annexations are effectively the same thing. Property in the town comes into the city of Madison. So will it have an impact on future attachments? Uh, will it have an impact on the extension of services? And in this case, staff has fallen on the side of, yes, we feel that it will. However, uh, we have recommended conditions that if the plant commission uh, was to disagree that we feel would do the next best possible thing to preserve our, our op options to potentially extend Nature Drive in the future, uh, to have a corridor that could be used for the extension of utilities. Uh, to serve the further development of the Jensen property should these two lots along the Burke Road frontage be created. Thank you, Tim. Did that answer your question, Commissioner Fernandez? Uh, pretty much. I guess my only follow-up would be, um, is, is there something that would mitigate it? If those two lots were, if if the reservation were in place, I, I guess I, I don't have the conditions right in front of me, but certainly there needs to be reservation of, of that right-of-way area. There needs to be um, certainly setbacks that, that make that appropriate for right away. Are there other conditions that would make this uh, at least slightly more palatable? Because, you know, 13 years is a pretty long horizon be be to have that land not work for the owners because we're preserving our options. And I, and I support preserving our options, but I really feel some sympathy for it people trying to make their family land work for them. Is there anything else we could require of that, make those two lots larger, uh, restrict the, where the housing is built on those lots, something that, something that would preserve our options um, while still allowing, you know, to development of two additional houses? I, I think when it comes to lots two and three, the, the two proposed residential lots, I think that, you know, we create them now, they're going to be there. We should assume in perpetuity. Uh, mm -hmm. they, could they be further divided in the future? You know, maybe. But for, for today, we, we can't really see into the, into the future. Um, the lots are going to be roughly one acre in size because the, the county zoning that they have approved, the RR1, the one stands for the minimum lot size, which is one acre. Uh, so you, you could shave a little bit off. You could make them a little bit bigger. I, I don't know that I want to really get into those sorts of details. Um, the, the purpose of the reservation is to make sure that between now and when, something doesn't get built as in particular between lots two and three. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, try to, you know, preserve our options uh, going forward. But even with those reservations and with those, uh, the language uh, that you see uh, in condition one at the top of page six, that doesn't preclude because, you know, until 2036, we don't have the ability to, to stop the town of Burke from issuing a building permit. I'm not suggesting that the Jensen family or their successors and assigns would, you know, sneak around and put something where the CSM says they shouldn't. Um, this is not an officially mapped reservation. This is like one step below it. 
uh, so we we don't even have the, the the official map protections that we occasionally talk about when you put something on the official map per MGO 16.25, you know, that no building permit can be issued, even if it's in, you know, still in, in outside the city in the town. Uh, that's a process that, you know, isn't here right now. That's something that would follow the Reiner NDP in my estimation. Uh, but yes, uh, the, the recommended condition in lieu of rejection is the closest I feel we can get to, you know, preserving the long game if we're going to approve the CSM. And to your point, you know, should we add a, a setback line uh, there, which again, would only be enforceable by the city once it's in, in the city. But if we, I mean, there's enough room on these proposed lots to put a 30 foot setback uh, adjacent to that panhandle of, you know, what would be the extension of Nature Drive, that I don't think it would negatively, I would hope it would not negatively affect uh, what uh, the Jensen family is anticipating. We have lots that are 175.87 feet wide. Uh, myself and someone who's on like a 7,500 square foot lot, I think we can find 30 feet there to uh, make sure that a house doesn't get too close to that street uh, should the street be built in the future. So if that was a condition that the plan commission wanted to add in approving the CSM, I think that that would be fine. Thank you, Tim. Did you have any further questions, Commissioner Fernandez? I don't think so. I might want some okay. help in phrasing uh, uh, some conditions for this. I'll say that. Thank you. Uh, Alder Heck. Thank you. Uh, Tim, I have, I think, three questions. First, um, the the approvals that were obtained from Town of Burke and Dane County were uh, related and necessary, but uh, totally different in that they're, they're not dealing with the same set of issues as the city. Uh, isn't that correct? That That's <clears throat> correct. Okay, thanks. Uh, second question, did you say when, did you have a guesstimate as to when the Reiner Neighborhood Development Plan would be ready for approval? Soon. Uh, we have <laughs> a draft out there for review. Uh, I, I don't know if Heather has a more specific uh, date in mind, uh, but it, we were waiting for complete green streets to be adopted uh, because that that has the uh, the framework for how we should be, you know, setting up the streets and and what how they're going to be classified, uh, and so I believe that that is still being worked on. Uh, but there is a draft that's available for review now. Uh, but exactly when we're anticipating introducing a resolution to adopt the plan, I couldn't say. It sounds like maybe within six months it could be approved, perhaps. Heather says probably, huh? Says, okay, yeah. so my last question is, if that were approved, do you think there would be uh, enough information in that to uh, make you uh, a little uh, more likely to recommend approval, perhaps with some conditions? Uh, will that give some valuable information that could change this discussion a little bit in your opinion? Uh, I think the thing that that would uh, potentially resolve is the intensity of development that we would foresee on this property, and it would provide more confirmation on the future of Nature Drive. Uh, I will, will say very clearly that the draft plan that's available for review shows Nature Drive coming straight north of, of Burke Road to serve a housing mix one uh, development pattern, uh, streets that would parallel uh, Burke Road. Uh, whether or not that particular street pattern, you know, that that finer grained pattern, so the street would come in north of, of Burke Road, you know, basically the northern extension of Nature Drive. Uh, but what would happen elsewhere on the property, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, there's still the potential that these proposed lots could impact uh, what that development pattern would look like. 
Now, it's, it's important to remember that the neighborhood development plans set forward a, a pretty specific uh, land use and street pattern that we would see, you know, taking into consideration lot lines, topography, uh, future city boundaries, uh, you know, uh, certainly, I, well, I said topography, so I won't say it again, although I think I just did, um, that, you know, we're, we're, we're taking into a lot of consideration, a lot of things, but it ultimately is going to take a developer looking at a piece of property, you know, getting a land surveyor out on the property, working with a civil engineer to figure out what will work on that property to sort of bring, you know, more shape to what the neighborhood development plan is generally showing. So if these two lots get created, leaving aside the nature drive question, there would still potentially be impacts on where the northern line of lots two and three sit in relationship to what you can do with the rest of lot one, assuming lot one is going to be developed by somebody with a housing mix one or low density housing uh, uh, type of development pattern. Uh, so the, we'll have more certainty about what the intensity of development would be in the future. We'd have a general idea of where the street network will go, what it will look like. Uh, but no, the adoption of the plan wouldn't provide absolute certainty uh, as it pertains to the proposed lots. Um, okay, thank you. That was my that was those were my questions. Any further questions of staff? Seeing no raised hands, I'm looking for a motion. Alder Paulson. Uh, I would move to place this on file without prejudice. Is there a second? Seconded by Alder Heck. Uh, Alder Paulson, did you wish to speak to your motion? Uh, I mean, I think we've been, staff has been working on the the Reiner plan for a while. We've got um, uh, the draft out there um, with the street grid and the um, housing mix that we have planned for not just this lot, but kind of the the other area. I'm, it is one of our, it's in the plan, it's one of the more, uh, more denser places that we're going to put folks and. Uh, I'm just a little hesitant to to gum that up right now. I'd rather wait to see a little bit to have better understanding. Okay, thank you. Uh, it looks like Tim has a comment. Tim? Yeah, I, I would just encourage the the maker of the motion and you know anyone speaking to the motion to address the extraterritorial criteria in terms of um, development pattern, impact on annexations, extension of services. Certainly the neighborhood development plan could, uh, you know, provide shape to that. Uh, but I would counsel against making the motion based on uh, an as of yet unadopted plan. Thank you. Walter Paulson, did you want to further clarify? Yeah. Uh... Yes, I, I am concerned about um, our our extraterritorial uh, um, I'm trying to remember the right word for it our, our extraterritorial um, uh, criteria here. So perhaps I uh, can come back in a second and uh, collect my thoughts a little better. Uh, but but I am concerned about them. Okay. Um, Commissioner Fernandez. Just, we were to put it on file without prejudice and the applicant were to continue to work. Are, am I muted? No. Oh, the, we okay. can hear you. Go okay, ahead. A little, little screen thing popped up, said I was, but um, if we place this on file, does that open some possibility for, you know, further refinement of this plat and of this CSM 
um, with you know stronger reservations or something like that. Are, are we are we getting anywhere by kicking the can down the road? Uh, I, I you know Alder Paulson is saying, well, we may have the neighborhood plan in hand. I believe I'm hearing staff saying that's really only a small piece of the puzzle. You know that um, is there is there a purpose in your mind served by further discussion with the applicant? Um, so placing on file without prejudice would allow the applicant to, to come back to the plan commission uh, with the same request or a different request. Uh, and I suppose from the, the, the standpoint of were the neighborhood development plan adopted, uh, we would pursuant to Alder Heck's uh, line of questioning a few moments ago, we would maybe have a little more certainty beyond just the extension of the street. It's possible that the proposed lots could look uh, different, uh, that perhaps they would approach Dane County for a different zoning classification than the RR1. Now, I don't wanna assume that the Jensen family wants smaller lots. Uh, that may not be what they're looking for. Uh, I guess it would give them the opportunity to, to contemplate what they would wanna do uh, and then come forward with a different CSM. They would have to go back through the town of Burke approval process. They'd have to go back through the Dane County approval process uh, to some extent or another. Uh, they would have to work that out with those those jurisdictions. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, perhaps the some of the plan commission discussion tonight is maybe pointing the the applicants in a direction whereby the plan commission might feel that the request is more tenable. Um, I don't know from staff's perspective that I can necessarily sit here tonight and tell you uh, that I am going to be less concerned about development pattern or impacts on future attachments and extension of services. Uh, I kind of feel like those are still going to be factors. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's, it's the plan commission's decision to make, not mine. And so, you know, maybe the lots look different and or the lots look the same and we have a neighborhood development plan that gives the plan commission a little more assurance uh, or, you know, maybe even says, hey, staff, can you look at the, the neighborhood plan and plot how these two lots look in relation to that so that we know, is it too deep? Is it going to bust up a potential, you know, block of, of lots because we're going to have lots that are, oh boy, 286.58 feet deep. And that would be twice as much uh, depth as you know you would expect with more conventional urban development lots but we would have a neighborhood plan that we could you know formally you know maybe do some gis magic and and come to the plan commission and say this is what those lots would do versus um now where it's conjecture So you're saying that development you. patterns might be better scoped out and that that wouldn't be as much of an issue. Is that what you're saying in part? Yes, in part. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder Paulson? Yeah, I guess I would just, uh, it's late and it's been a long day. So uh, I am concerned about um, this proposal's uh, 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 potential impact on our ability to extend services to uh, uh, future uh, 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 to this area in the uh, in the future, and I think that the uh, proposed plan is inconsistent with um, with the uh, uh, the general land development pattern uh, out in that area. So I think that we should place it on file uh, without prejudice and continue to work on it uh, to see what what we can do uh, looking forward. Okay, thank you. And uh, we did have a second, didn't we? 
I'm not recalling. Okay, Alder Heck had seconded. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing no raised hands, we'll come to a vote. I will assume unanimous consent unless I see a raised hand to object. Seeing no raised hands, motion passes unanimously. Uh, is there any business by members? Uh, secretary's report, Heather. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the council meeting, the last council meeting on January 17th, the council did move forward with plan commission recommend recommendations on the transit-oriented development overlay ordinance after much discussion. Um, also, 118 West Wilson, the addition to the public safety facility, and also 310 to 322 East Washington Avenue for St. John's Lutheran Church redevelopment. Um, moving forward to our February 13th meeting, the main thing I want to note on this one is that um, the council did discuss and decide to uh, change the schedule, the referral schedule again, back to what it was for the family definition. And so the plan commission will be hearing uh, the update to the family definition on February 13th. Um, and then finally, looking forward to February 27th, a long slate of items all interrelated. This is really the, the batch of rezonings and official map reservations associated with the Odana area plan. And so you'll recall we had a, a similar batch of these related to the Oscar Meyer plan. Um, I wanna thank staff from not only planning but particularly engineering mapping for helping pull this together. It takes a lot of time to survey and create legal, legal descriptions for um, for these elements that will be before you on February 27th and looking forward to, to moving forward with these soon. Uh, thanks so much for your service and we will see you soon. Thank you. Okay, I think that that does it unless anybody uh, else has any announcements then I would be looking for a motion to adjourn. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Uh, moved by Commissioner Solheim, seconded by Commissioner Shepard. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Oh, I'll assume unanimous consent unless I ever see a raised hand to object. And thank you very much. See you all in a couple of weeks.